One Angry Puritan, A Fumbling Family of Five, and The Home I Hope to Retire In. Welcome to From the Bone Vault, coming to you live from below Midnight Lair. I'm Gil. And I'm Levi. This week we're watching Mr. Boogity and Brian Boogity. <laughs> Levi, hit me with some facts. Well, Gil, both of these movies aired as Disney Sunday Night Movies, which was a rebranding of the wonderful world of Disney. That is in a mouthful. The, yeah, it, <laughs> I had to say it about three times. Um, <laughs> it was a rebranding of that in the 80s. And... Michael the, Eisner, kids, you remember him. Yeah, he even has a little intro. I think you linked it to me, uh, the little intro of The Wonderful World of Disney, which I totally remembered. Uh, we had this on VHS tape. We had both of these recorded, and I watched them often. Oh, man, it was so good. I remember <laughs> that. Like, you'd hear that, the Disney theme, and it's yeah. like, you're glued to the TV. And then it went to, in, to like, that techno sort of version of it that bump da bump da bump da bump I remember that anyway uh back to boogity mr boogity aired on april 20th 1986 and it was a pretty popular movie so they made a sequel which was released a year later in april on april 12th of 1987 i'm not oh, quite it was sure was april 1st well i don't even know why it was in april because <laughs> these are supposed to be scary movies but anyway they were very popular and the scripts were penned by a Michael Janover, and they were originally created as a Cheech and Chong script called Cheap Thrills. <laughs> I almost fell out of my chair when I found that little factoid. I'm like, Isn't are you crazy? kidding me? <laughs> I, I can only just... imagine what that movie would have been like. It had and... been like Shaggy and Scooby, but not good. <laughs> well, uh, even Janover himself, or I think maybe this might have been uh, the director. I'm not sure. I, I read a couple of different articles, but one of them compared it to Airplane and said that it would have basically been Scary Movie before Scary Movie came out, right? which could have been fun, like a, an 80s version of Scary Movie. If it would have been the original guys that did Airplane, yeah, 100%, I could have seen yeah. that, but these guys, <laughs> mm. Yeah, he said that he had some sort of script about a geriatric Dracula, and the first scene is <laughs> Dracula bending over to bite this woman and his teeth fall out, so... I don't know. I don't know how great the whole movie would have been, but... And then they took that and made Dracula dead and loving it. <laughs> there you go. Uh. Hey, yeah, I didn't think about that. Um, but anyway, this movie was shot, surprise, surprise, entirely on Disney's back lot, the first movie, in a couple of weeks. And the music, which I actually kind of liked, it's this big brassy score at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. It was performed by about 20 or 25 musicians, and the whole... Uh, the whole orchestral score for the movie was done that way. And the word boogity actually came from a 1984 movie written by Stephen King called Cat's Eye. And did you see anything about this, Gil? Well, see, I, I had read that little tidbit in my research as well. I just didn't connect it. I just thought, oh, okay, good, factoid. And I didn't look it up. Uh, Levi actually linked that quick clip to me right before <laughs> we started. And I got to see that. And my reaction was, that's where they got it? Yeah, I expected Some this big random... scene, but it's just this guy is on the side of a building, kind of inching his way along. They they bet this guy to go out on this ledge and go around the building. And while he's doing it, this guy like grabs his finger and goes, boogie, boogie, boo. And <laughs> he doesn't even say And then say waves it like a that. red scarf at him. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that was your, oh, <laughs> Disney guys, what were you thinking? Well, you know, it, it gave me a lot of good times for my childhood, so I appreciate mm -mm -mm. it. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> but a couple more production tidbits. Go for um, it. Let's see. First of all, Christy Swanson plays Jennifer in the first movie, who we yes. probably all know as Buffy, um, among other I roles. I was so excited to see her. <laughs> when I saw her, I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, that's Buffy! It is. Yes! The original she didn't do any car uh, wheels, though. cinematic Buffy, I know. <laughs> but she actually... When she she was interviewed at the 25 year anniversary of Boogity, and she said that a young man named Leaf was auditioning for one of the brothers, 
And this young man's full name was Leaf Phoenix, who later changed his name to Walking Phoenix. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, that's awesome. Walking Phoenix almost played Corwin, which was played by, uh, oh, I forget his name. Let me look it up here. He was uh, Bud on Married with Children, David Faustino. See, I put that little tidbit in, and I thought, okay, cool. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get this in and show Levi. Oh, look at that, it's Bud. <laughs> yeah, no, everyone knows that's Bud. Everyone <laughs> right. Knows. And for a second, I, I saw the first movie, and he looks different enough in the first movie. I, I was like, is that him? Is that not? I couldn't quite tell because he's so young. But yeah, he's he's Onset actually of the, puberty will do that. Yeah, and he's actually <laughs> the only child who is the same in both movies, including Jonathan, the ghost boy that we'll get to. Yep. Also, Oz Scott, the man who directed it, at the 25th anniversary, he gave an interview as well, and he said that he came to Disney, and he actually wanted to do a sequel or a remake, and Disney said, uh, no thanks, we'll pass. So, <laughs> <laughs> much to my chagrin, and apparently there was a, a, a petition around that 25-year anniversary, and it had gotten, I don't know, 7,000 signatures or something to put Mr. Boogity and Bride of Boogity on DVD, so... It's a very much a cult classic movies and a big part of a lot of people's childhood, I guess. With that, do you want to get into the movies? Do you have any facts to give us, Gil? No, no. I mean, that pretty much sums it up. Most of the films we've covered so far and things we've touched had a lot of chewy bits to them. Other than, like, and this is still a major part, This these two films were kind of the first starts of two two actresses that are actually fairly big staples in horror films, specifically Buffy, and we'll get to the second one when we get to Bride of Boogity. Um, but there was not a lot to chew on with this film beyond the film itself. Right. Um, so, I mean, yeah, yeah, let's let's get right into the film. I mean, I've got my play-by-play -play here, so if, if my notes are a little scattered this time, guys, it's uh, I, I kind of did this almost like a live Twitter feed of watching the film, so I'm going to jump <laughs> around a little bit. That's okay. I'll, I'll keep us grounded. I kept pretty detailed notes, so I can guide you through these movies that... I love so much. <laughs> Hopefully you won't tear them asunder too badly. Oh, oh yeah. Let's, let's get that out of the way now. Levi liked and remembers this film. I did not watch this as a kid, so I got to watch it cold as a horror fan. And I'm going to be a little mean, guys. I'm well, sorry. You, you talked about your nostalgic goggles in other episodes, and mine were on tightly. And I'll, I'm not going to defend to the death because, yeah, there are some horrible things in these movies. But I, oh, I still got a kick out of them. But uh, anyway, we start in the first movie, and the Davises are moving to Lucifer Falls. And Stop. Okay. Stop right there. <laughs> Go no further. <laughs> Lucifer Falls. Yeah, it's a great place to raise a family, Gil. This is the sound of me throwing my highlighter. Right there. Lucifer Falls. What person in their right minds... You're going to hear me say this a lot. What person in their right minds does this? <laughs> I want to live in Lucifer Falls. I want to say I have a house there. But yeah. I'm warped. <laughs> well, I'm damaged. To be fair, I think Carlton Davis is a little warped. <laughs> And I think Eloise has spent enough time with him that she's either become warped or she, well, judging from her brother, that she was probably warped, warped at a young age. Proxy. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> heading into this movie, uh, one thing that caught my attention was, you know, he sells gags. And it seemed like there were a lot of movies when I was a kid that I liked that had to do with gags or gadgets. There was uh, Gremlins. The dad sold weird little inventions. Right. And then uh, just this weekend, this last weekend, I watched Two Frame Roger Rabbit with my son. And, of course, that had Marvin Acme in it. And he sold, like, joy buzzers and everything. And also, I always remember that great scene in... Uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure when he goes into the magic joke shop and the guy's showing him all the stuff. So this was definitely something that was a large part of my childhood was these little gag things. And I remember getting the little ones in the plastic bag at like gift yes. shops and stuff. Like, like I, my favorite thing I remember are those little fun things with the wind up teeth that would just tick 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 across something. Those were right. the best. Yeah. But I guess I never made that correlation. Now that you say it, I'm mapping it in my head. That's an odd thing to do for dads in films. And it was really yeah. a dad door-to-door -door salesman like profession. Right. I mean, they could have been selling vacuums for all we care, mm -hmm. but it was jokes they were selling. Hmm. Right. Yeah. That's, I never made that corollary. <laughs> so they're sitting there, they're driving in in this establishing shot. They come around and have this quick little respite and hang out and just kind of be like, hey, <laughs> we need to stretch our legs. Let's hang out. Let's go goof around and establish that <laughs> yucks. <laughs> hey, they're a fun family to hang around. Uh, it, it, 
it bothered me. I again, maybe it's because I'm an adult looking back. I could see where the kids would just kind of go ha 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 and move on. But ugh. I always wanted to. Uh, of course, my family jokes around a lot. My dad doesn't sell gags door to door or anything. But um, <laughs> that would but be a coincidence. We definitely have an easy sense of humor, and uh, we joked around a lot as kids. And I even remember my dad after we had watched this movie. I would walk around saying boogity and he would say boogity kidding <laughs> but anyway yeah those nostalgia goggles sorry guys but uh, we'll move on they go to this new house that carlton has found uh i would say on the internet but this was 1986 i don't know how he found this house but you have the realty sign the realtor's name is cb Karloff, and the realty company is devil may care Get it? Because they're in Lucifer Falls. Get it? <laughs> do you get it, audience? Do you get the joke? No, I do have to say that was that was some of my favorite parts of the film is those little that those kind of gags, the sight gag of eh, you know elbow to the ribs. Mm-hmm. That house, though. Yeah, it's that awesome house, house, though. If we if I could call Disney and say, hey Disney, do you still have do you still have that set? Do you st- do, you, do you have that that piece that you built that thing? <laughs> no, nope, it was shell? torn down. You tore that down? You burned that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. Di- Sorry Disney, I, Disney, I hate you. And uh, I also love you. Bye. Click. We're not fond of you, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they actually did tear the entire set down. Uh, oh, man. That's unfortunate. That was awesome. <laughs> but it, what it reminded me of, what this house reminded me of, was the Psycho Mansion. Because yeah. there's that scene in Psycho where the guy falls down the stairs and kind of out the front door. That's what this reminded me of because you walk right. in the house and the stairs are right there and also the outside of the house looks pretty similar and we, i gotta say something i love about these movies that you might possibly hate are all of eloise's reactions and little lines that she puts in there's like a creepy shadow in the corner and jennifer says mom look over there and she goes don't point honey and pushes her hand <laughs> down i know it's a little thing but all the mom's little lines i love i love eloise's lines but in this the shadows family. This family is completely nonplussed that nothing gets yeah. through them. And if they have a reaction, it is like, huh, or yeah. hmm, isn't that odd? The that Adams seems- family reacted to stuff quicker than they did. That seems like a theme that runs through each of the protagonists that we've had, because that was the same in This Island Earth as, Earth as well with Cal. Yeah, he well, really didn't react Cal, to anything. Cal was kind of like that square jawed Indiana Jones style guy that was a a the rough and rugged scientist, or you know, in, in Indiana Jones's case, the rough and rugged professor. Mm-hmm. So I, I get that for him. That's a character trait. But this family is just like it's almost like everything's a joke. Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, they have to look at things that way because they live with Carlton and. Every morning they eat rubber eggs and get squirted by their eggs. So they have to get used to that. But Gil, we have to talk about the shadow that comes out and speaks to them. None other than, who is it? It's Gomez! It's Gomez Adams. (laughs) It's John Aston! I was squeed. Great. I genuinely squeed as soon as the lights came up because I didn't know. Again, I can remember I came into this cold, guys. Uh-huh. Didn't IMDb at nothing. So as soon as it came up and it's Gomez <laughs> in this outfit, I'm like, you're kidding. Yeah. And he has a great part. He's sort of a absent minded, not really absent minded, but he he always seems like he's distracted by something or that maybe he just wants to get out of the house because he he tells them basically to get out of the house and not to stay there. And of course they don't heed his warnings because they're the Davises and they just do whatever they want. No, it'd have been like the Amityville horror. It'd have been like, right. they come in the guy's like, Oh great. <laughs> look at the chandelier and this great artwork and all that. Get out. Well, time to leave guys. We gotta <laughs> right. go. No, it wouldn't have been a movie. <laughs> and there was one little line here that, uh, I was going to call him Gomez. Neil Witherspoon says to Jennifer, he says, I have an unusual son. And he's about your age. And if you'll notice, there's a character in the second movie that is named Witherspoon. His first name is Walter, but I'm not quite sure that's his son because I don't think he's the same age as Jennifer. But I thought it was interesting that the Witherspoons sort of are the family that tracks the history of the town, it seems like. And they're all a little weird. They're they all, all a little wear, weird. They all wear tricorn hats. Yeah. And they all speak very oddly. <laughs> weird family. So they decide they actually want to move into this haunted house so in that scene something that kind of struck me though was just the way that john Aston did that he came in real hot and heavy with you must get out of this house and then he does the line i want you to keep an eye out 
for the Boogity Man. Boogity! 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 Boo! And he's just in it. He's in it. His face is all... And then he just... Whoom, drops down and goes... And walks out. Yeah. <laughs> like nothing happened. And the family's going, uh... Okay. He was Let's just move warning on. them. And he warned them. And now he's going to head out. And see. And then uh, we have sort of two concurrent scenes after that. We have the boys exploring the house. And Jennifer is also talking about how no one here probably knows who Bruce Springsteen is. Which <laughs> I don't really know what that means. But she hears us. That has a, to have been a, like a throwaway 80s line. Yeah. I mean, it's just like... <laughs> But she hears a sneeze, and so she starts walking down the hallway. Oh, and yeah. at the end of the hallway, there's this door, and it's kind of glowing around it. And one of the notes that I read was that the director had them put this door in, and they actually couldn't see the glow from behind it. So he had them trim the door so that the, the light would come through. It was a, it was a cool effect. I got to give him that. I mean, it, it, yeah. it did look, and it didn't detract from the scene. You, you no. unless I Until I'd read that note... I wouldn't have known any difference. Yeah, so I didn't was, notice that was it pretty either. well done. So I guess we'll move to the next day, and Buffy's wearing this pink p- puffy pantsuit. It's this glorious well, I, '80s. I just uh, <laughs> what? It's puffy and it's got uh, pockets on it everywhere. And she comes in, and her dad pranks her with rubber eggs and squirts her brother with these squirting eggs and. Ari, the younger kid, had these mm. weird glasses on. I've seen them before, but they've got like fake eyes on them. Yeah, the, the I think those very are the creepy. collapsible buggy eyes glasses. Yeah, those are no. These were different. Weird. These had like uh, silk screen, oh, like the cardboard paper. Yeah, they're ones? like cardboard oh, okay. of like weird squinty eyes. I actually have a pair oh, of man. those that are zombie eyes on my desk at work. Wow, I'll have to bring those. They, let you they see. They freak them. me out. So be careful. <laughs> 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 but uh yeah we've got this recurring joke also of the dad saying gag city because that's the name of his store that he's putting into this town and he always says haha just kidding which will be important in the second movie oh that the line <laughs> that line go ahead but anyway jennifer we go back to her and she hears the sneezing again and she decides to go toward it and for some reason, she has a candle. I don't know why she doesn't have a flashlight. This is 1986, but uh, maybe... <laughs> well, maybe they're all... They, they could all be yeah, flashlights. They though. all have snakes that pop out when you turn <laughs> them on. <laughs> but then she sees the door again. It has this green glow, and uh, she faints clean away when she opens the door. And her family is around her, and her mom leans down and says... We found you lying here, honey. You were clicking your heels together, and all you would say is, there's no place like home. And I want to put a pin in this, because this is a reference to The Wizard of Oz, and we will loop back around to this multiple times. (sighs) But (laughs) one of the worst pieces of acting in this movie is right here. It's in my notes, too. I saw him! Who? Uh, and then one of the boys responds when the parents re- react to her going, oh, Jennifer. One of the boys looks up at her total attitude and goes, yeah, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> that was unwarranted. Why didn't one of your parents slap you? Because they they want to say that to her as well, I think. Because uh, one thing I noticed in both movies is Jennifer's kind of the canary in the coal mine. She makes first contact yeah. and nobody really believes her. And there's this theme of nobody in the family believing anybody until they sort of have their own experience. And you'd think after this first experience they would learn, but they do not. It's almost like the the Wiley e. Coyote. They gotta get hit completely yes. with the anvil before they realize the anvil. Right. There. They don't believe anyone else. And there's this funny scene where they see these green footprints on the wall and oh, the dad God. starts putting them taking them off the wall and uh the mom says uh, Eloise says Oh, that is strange. And he starts taking them off the wall and she goes, careful, Carlton. You don't want to get those on your pajamas. <laughs> Which, I, I don't know. It makes me laugh. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm going to do an edit of this film that has laugh track on it. Hey, I would watch that. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he takes these, these goofy things and slaps them all over his body, turns around to the family mm-hmm. and says, hey, look. Mr. Boogity walked all over me. <laughs> yuck, 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 yuck. It's yuck, funny, yuck. Gil. It's funny. It, uh, but then... there. Are, look, I... Mm, go ahead. I was going to say the next scene is cool because Ari and Corwin are in the kitchen, which is sort of be is uh, 
like the ex, uh, poltergeist activity, you know, everything's banging. And apparently the portal to hell is in the toaster because this red light comes out. <laughs> yeah, that was a really cool scene. Uh, there's this creepy laughing that comes out of it. But uh, after that, we have the kids walking along in uh, Lucifer Falls downtown. And I noticed Ari had this really cool bomber jacket, which was kind of the thing in the 80s. I don't know if you remember that. Maybe I don't know the distinction, but I always thought that was a members only jacket. No, no, no. Uh, I'm talking about the younger kid. Oh, he had the, oh okay, okay, okay. The leather with the the puffy collar. That's right. The aviator jacket. That's yeah. right. Was, well, uh, yeah, members only was definitely an 80s thing, too. <laughs> But they go to talk to Mr. Witherspoon about what's happening in their house. And so we have story time with Gomez. And he brings out this really huge, cool pop-up history book. That was pretty cool. That was yeah. pretty cool. My, my, my <laughs> gut reaction was, what is this? But then as they went through it, I'm like, okay, okay, this is actually kind of a cool setup. I thought it was also cool. They went into the flashback of the story that he was telling, and they sort of brought that forward with the backgrounds were two-dimensional, so it looked kind of like a stage play. And uh, they, he brings up William Hanover, who is Mr. Boogity, we find out later on, and the Widow Marion and Jonathan, which these make up the three ghosts that we see throughout both movies. And there's more bad acting right here with uh, Marion. I don't know if you noticed, but man. Oh, that whole scene had the bad man, acting. Man, it was bad. And then it goes to a sequence of the devil in front of a building that says hot clothes. Hold on. Hold okay. on. My initial thought as soon as I saw this was, that's where Hot Topic got it. Oh my gosh. That had to have been it. That's not where they got that idea. I will eat one of my pumpkins. I think you just blew my mind. I, I wouldn't doubt it if they did. <laughs> wow. But then when he when he opens that, that book and you see that, that, like the devil does kind of that, like you get the scene of John Adams' character opening the book and you see the the frame but then mm -hmm. you see the devil himself in the stage play as right. were, and he opens his piece up or closes yeah. something did you see that sign over the rack of um mm -mm. costumes i couldn't tell what it said whether it said bad guy clothes <laughs> or bar guy clothes wow so it, it, of course it that. had to have been bad but yeah how ridiculous is That's that? Hilarious. It's like, did you know the devil has an entire closet of bad guy clothes? That's something a 12-year-old <laughs> says. Like, he's got right. a whole closet of bad guy clothes that he, like, gives guys when they, when they sell their soul. I mean, yeah, this this movie, I'm not degrading it at all, but it, it's, it's kind of like it was written by a 12-year-old. And it kind of reminds me of a, a, a more, quote-unquote, mature version of Axe Cop, but for, <laughs> you know, horror. It just, You've they throw no, all this Levi, horror things in. You have officially changed how I view this movie. Now I look at this as it was written by a five-year-old and scripted by the 12-year-old listening. Let's there keep you go. going. <laughs> so um, we find out that Boogity gets a magic cloak, which is Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. And he... Um, D&D <laughs> players would kill <laughs> any other player in their game for this cloak. Yeah. It can that, do... It can do yeah. anything. He uses it to kidnap Jonathan, and he tries to cast a spell. And there's a great scene. Gomez is like, he, uh, and it seems like he's making it up as he goes along. And he's like, uh, yeah, he he casts a spell, and it, and he blew up his house. And then uh, Christy Swanson comes in, blew up his house, and the beat in between <laughs> that when he says, and he blew up his house, but a heartbeat. <laughs> he blew up his house. What the hell? And then Ari says, what a dope. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. These it's kids so crack me up. <laughs> but um, anyway, this, you know, I'm not going to pick this movie apart, but I did find a glaring plot hole right here. So ah. we find out later on that Boogity and Jonathan are trapped in the house. Marion can't get in the house. But Mr. Witherspoon says that they've built multiple houses on that property. So when one of the houses was torn down, wouldn't they have been freed in some way? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know that they would have addressed it. I don't know. To me, the continuity would, have, continuity would have kept that they could not manifest unless there's a house there. Mm. Because then, like, when they were building okay. the home, they would have talked about maybe, like, oh, builders never built anything because it was haunted. Uh, maybe there had to be a structure there for them to inhabit. Good save. Good save. You saved one of my childhood movies. I was going to just welcome. dismiss it forever. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what shocked me. I made a quick note. How much time passed between when they had that conversation with Mr. Witherspoon? It was, what, maybe 
mid morning. I didn't think about that. Yeah. And then by the time they get home, it is is pitch black. Yeah. I didn't think about that. It is night. I mean, they could have just been exploring the city during the day. Mom and dad are unpacking all the inventory. And um, when they. Oh, you know what? Canonically, this makes sense because if it's fall. Then the schedule would have sure. been different where night would have come in a little sooner. Uh, and yeah. it, and it, they said that the second movie, it had been a year and a couple of months since that happened. So oh. I just saved it twice. Good catch. Good That's catch. two saves. I didn't think you'd want to reinforce this movie. I thought you'd want to tear <laughs> it down more, but I appreciate it. No, nah, I'm not going to be that mean. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they come in and Carlton tries to scare him with this gorilla mask. And I guess he's wearing a beach towel for a, a, a cape. I... The, Oh, the dad makes me hurt so bad. What? I, the, let's just move on. (laughs) Well, for the first time we hear Eloise's laugh, which is very distinctive, sort of a gasping, uh, throaty, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's very distinctive. Need a hand? (laughs) And Carlton Hamily tries to get Jennifer to turn on the, uh, the vacuum cleaner and out pops a clown and his kids are get it trying to tell him that something happened and he just does not it does not register in his face at all and all of a sudden we have the weirdest haunting ever in this house some sort of harpsichord music starts playing the gloves start clapping this mummy comes to life and flailing his arms in some sort of weird dance that little clip is actually part of the opening sequence yeah. for the wonderful world of disney the it sunday is. movie i noticed thing. that <laughs> That mummy. And why did they choose that? I guess because of the movement, but it seemed like there would be other portions that would be better to Maybe put in the Maybe because he open. was dancing? I, I guess. Uh... I don't know. But there was another great Eloise line. I'm going to bring this up a lot, but she goes, time to call a realtor. And Carlton says, now how can you say that? She points to her mouth and goes, time to call a realtor. <laughs> <laughs> Which I like that sort of humor where people sort of misinterpret what someone says or to kind of take it in a, a funny direction that I kind of appreciate that comedy. And I'm a big fan of Abbott and Costello and they right. have some of that where there's sort of misunderstanding with the words. And I kind of like that. But anyway, we this have- episode brought to you by Abbott and Costello, where good writing happens. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's what we I should do- tackle sometime. <laughs> Meet Frankenstein. That would be fun. Stay tuned, guys. That one's coming. <laughs> so, r- real quick on that scene, and this will dovetail into the next, into the next when it transitions. Yes. What is with the way these parents react to things? Because, like, they literally, there's no yeah. jokes. There's no, how did you get, they, they kind of say, well, how did you guys do that? How did you guys do that? Like, dad, we didn't do anything. Right. This place is haunted. We're not kidding. And then there's kind of a, hmm, mm-hmm. maybe it is. And then what happens, Levi? Let's have a sleepover. They go camping in the front room. Yeah, that's his solution to this house may be haunted. Well, let's all sleep together in the living room. And (laughs) And they went with it. They went with it. The mom went, (laughs) okay, honey. Well, that's the thing about her. She's always with Carlton. She sort of, she doesn't necessarily play into him. She plays with him with everything she's definitely on board for everything he does that is kind of cool i'll give you that they they really yeah. play that up and and she's she's a hundred percent behind him and everything right. he does she's not judgy and that's something you could find in the 80s like in sitcoms and stuff it's the right and even today you have the the mom that's doing things and the dad's the bumbling idiot and in this one the dad is a bumbling idiot but the mom doesn't berate him for that she just sort of plays into it and she embraces it yeah embraces it and we have another recurring element that starts right here while carlton is telling a story a ghost story a ghost story he stops for a second and this wolf howls and this comes back multiple times through both movies (laughs) and we have jennifer yelling again horribly acting and then we go to everyone's asleep and uh for some reason, in the 80s, every mom wore a sleeping mask. Did you notice this? It was a weird trend. Like, in it was it, everything in the 80s. Beetlejuice, she pops up, click, and then goes back to sleep. Yeah. I, I don't <laughs> know. I've never seen someone sleep with a sleep mask on before, except in movies and television. Uh, quick uh, interjection note. Gil's wife sleeps with a sleeping mask. Really? She actually does. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. She's the first person I've known. That's there pretty cool. So... When we see the mom, did you look at her as soon as she started raiding the fridge and go, are Shaggy and Scooby coming over? Yeah, because she gets this platter 
and it has, I, I think there were slices of cheese and cellophane, I think deli meat, a stick of bread, like a half a loaf of bread, a tomato. It was a huge amount of food. A full tomato and a full bell pepper, uncut. Like, what's she going to do? Chew on it like an apple? I mean, she had this huge plate of food. And it's funny you mentioned the Shaggy and Scooby because I really think that this movie, and especially the second one, if you look at them as episodes of Scooby-Doo, they're really quite enjoyable because they have sort of the same tone. And there are points in the other movie, I'll try to get to them, where they're actually analogous to a lot of Scooby-Doo elements. I could see that. But um, anyway, we find out that she's pretty unflappable she's pretty brave she hears this knocking on the window and just steps outside and we get this pink glow from marion and there's this great interaction their whole interaction is great but um she asks marion hey do you want to come inside for some coffee marion bursts into tears and she said is it something about coffee dear something that's painful for ghosts about coffee It's such a great I gotta line. Say, the, the mom is the saving grace of this film. She's got the best one line. She's hilarious. Like and just her vocal intonation, and she sort of squeaks out her lines in this. And she, Marion's talking about how she was kept from Jonathan, and she goes, He kept you from him? How dare he? <laughs> and and Marion says, Keepeth, which I was like, Really? Do we have to? Are we trying to be accurate in an inaccurate way by having her say, Keepeth? Hey, if you want to make a film about Puritans, just add if to everything. Right. <laughs> to everything. And but you're fine. They find out that uh, Boogity, they have to get rid of him and his cloak. And so they go on a hunt for him. Carlton's got his huge fly swatter. And uh, Eloise. The kids have a wiffle bat. Yeah. Uh, uh, Corwin has a wiffle bat and Ari has some sort of foam hammer. It kind of looked like Mjolnir or whatever uh, <laughs> Thor's hammer is called. But um, as they're walking up the stairs, Eloise, everybody's behind Carlton. And Eloise says, what if he blows us up? And the family turns and starts to leave. <laughs> and uh, Carlton gets him to follow him. And, okay, Ari and Corwin do not play D&D. And how do I know that, Gil, at this scene? I actually put a note here that said these kids are actually funny because some of the stuff they say. C- catch me up on this one. What, well, maybe I missed this part. But they don't play D&D because they don't know that you never split the party. <laughs> Ari wanders off. Corwin wanders off looking for Ari. You never Here's do this. Here's the thing. This. They're, the, they're the rogues of the party. They're scouting, right? Well, that's true. This whole I think it's just a family full of rogues. Maybe that's their problem. Oh, <laughs> no, I think you've got a bard with like seven charisma, but we won't go there. <laughs> but um and the dad has a funny line. He and his wife and his daughter come around the corner in the green glow. He goes, "Uh, did somebody leave a weird green light on in that room?" <laughs> and he goes to talk to Boogity, and Buffy says, "Dad's going to negotiate with Hamburger Face." No, the 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 the, the <laughs> That's like the one scene of the film where I'm like, okay, that's actually teenage angsty acting right there. Because she got that whole, dad's going to go negotiate right. with hamburger face. Right. And she gets that neck swivel. I'm like, uh-huh. okay, you actually acted that pretty well. Right. Bravo. Right. But did you notice that when he opens the door, the bulb in the room is actually green? It's not supernatural. I was like, what? There's actually a green bulb in there? <laughs> But we go back to the basement and Ari is screaming and Corwin comes around and he's wrestling a ghost boy. Uh, well, we find out it's a ghost boy. It's this ball of lightning or something that's shooting off. They actually had cool particle effects, I thought, of the the lightning and whatever the yeah. little sparkles were. <clears throat> the that the came interactions off of and stuff and the color schemes they used for everybody mm-hmm. were really cool. It's probably that Disney uh, money that was behind it. They were able to put money into those effects. and Right. Anyway, they... Uh, they meet this little boy and they find out who he is. And Mr. Boogity appears. Is that the scene? Is that where he appears? I lost this is, my that's the, notes. That's the, tra- that's the transition. They talk for a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Ari says, he's coming. Right. Who's coming? And then it's uh, <gasps> Mr. They all Boogity. Turn. That's right. And this is where I have one of the biggest problems with this film. Okay. They do this massive build up to this character it's mr boogity he's bad he's oh no and it was this puritan guy and he's super evil and we have to and it's a boogity boogity boo and he comes into a shower of bubble and pop effects Mm -hmm. and a small amount of lightning to a guy in a rubber mask that doesn't fit him right right 
What the hell, Disney? Well, apparently, in this article that I read, the director said they gave them that mask and told them to use it, and it didn't fit their actor. And that's why in the second movie, the makeup looks a little better because they were actually to make a mask that fit him. But he said they were given this mask, and he didn't know what it was. He didn't know if it was supposed to be like a burn victim or something, but he was like, okay, well... We have this mask. That's what they gave us. We have to use it. So unfortunately, that was they must have spent money on effects, but not on getting an actual mask for this Puritan. And why is his face that way? I mean, did they? Wait, <laughs> like there's no canonical understanding. Right. Okay, the place blew up. Okay, right. so maybe, like well, you said, maybe true. he's a bur- he's a burn victim. Right. Maybe it's the magic going off and blowing his right. face back. Okay, okay, okay. I'll go with that. But I just this it's character's the- not scary. Right. This character did not scare me at all, and I couldn't see where a kid would be scared. He makes of that. things shake, and maybe that's why I liked it because I I didn't watch a lot of horror movies when I was a kid, but I watched this over and over and over, and I think maybe that was probably why because it didn't scare me, but it was a scary quote unquote thing, and it had those elements. Anyway, we can get back to the movie, and we have this unscary Mister Boogity that appears. And uh, they have this lightning hair gag where he shoots the family with lightning and their <laughs> their hair stands on end and they've got lightning teeming through their heads. And the dad tried to pl- like just like, hey, can't we just negotiate? Be- <laughs> <laughs> right. Ridiculous. But I mean, the whole family seems to be pretty brave. I mean, like you said, he's not super scary. But still, if this was happening in real life, I mean... Some people might run out of the I mean, yeah. Place I mean, I, I really tried to look at this through the lens of it's a Disney flick. Right. It's a. Right. Uh, you grade it on a curve. Yeah. But I mean, I I don't know. Maybe I need to go back and look at some of the other films that were, were put out around here. Because, I mean, you've got some of the stuff that came out from um, like the, the – and I could get my dates wrong here. But like The Secret of Nim and other Disney right. films, they had some fairly dark parts in those films that were genuinely scary from the lighting and the effects and the really right. swell of music they used. Was it right. just the team on this which is like, eh, this is – I did read one article that alluded to sort of the trend in the mid to late eighties of funny horror movies. Right. And they list like Beetlejuice, Adam's family, Hocus Pocus, those types of movies. And that this was sort of on the cusp of that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Cause that's this, this being later in the eighties and leading to those other nineties films where they right. kind of refined it. Right. I could see that. And it was sort of one of the first, uh, you know, comedy horror movies, and maybe it didn't quite find its footing. But obviously, it, it, it's popular. There are a lot of people out there that like it because they saw it as kids. But um, I, I personally felt it held up. But like I said, I have nostalgia goggles on, so <laughs> do what you will with that. But uh, we have this whole sequence. I don't think we need to necessarily go through everything that happens. But one thing that really disturbed me as a kid, I remembered, and as I watched it as an adult and someone with a child, it disturbed me even more, was... Corwin is being lifted into the air and Carlton takes a ladder and goes and puts it next to him to get him and he starts to climb the ladder and Boogity hits him with lightning and he's climbing in air and he can't get to his son. All right. And I remember when I saw this, it clicked and I remembered as a kid that freaked me out. He's like just looking to the side, climbing up this ladder, but not going anywhere. And then as a father, I I thought for a second about if that was my child and I was just you know, my emotions took over, I guess, which is kind of silly, but <laughs> I was like, wow, that's pretty disturbing. Maybe the reason maybe that didn't trigger me is I got lost for like a second in looking at the kid going, why don't you let go? Why yeah, don't you let right. go? But then he actually <laughs> says out loud, dad, I can't, my hands are stuck. Right. And that's a, that's sort of a theme in both movies that Boogity can make people grab things or right. plant them in place or or, or 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 affix them in the effect he's trying to come right off. which again was right. weird to me is is like if he's got all of this different power and everything mm-hmm. why again maybe it's appeared to maybe he doesn't know how to use it but like why would you only use like i'm gonna make you dance and then i'm gonna laugh about it and i'm gonna make you books fall and i'm gonna laugh about right. it and i'm gonna right. make you make a fart noise and i'm gonna laugh about it <laughs> Well, I think it's like you said, it's a Disney movie and it's a, moreover, it's a Disney Sunday night right. TV movie. Right. So they can't go too dark. Honestly, what I think would have been cool is if they would have remade this at the 25 or maybe they could remake it at the 30 year anniversary. Wait, and maybe that would be this maybe year. Maybe darken it Never up mind. a little bit. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe 
you know, not go totally R rated or anything, oh, no, but just no. punch it up like a little Tim bit Burton. and update it. Yeah, and update it and and make it a little spookier. And Johnny Depp some, is oh, Mister Boogity, of course, and he's got some weird haircut. And I can Helen Habonham <laughs> Carter is <laughs> oh, my the the other chick, Eloise. 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 Oh, no, she's uh she's uh Marion. Ma- Marion. <laughs> And let's see, the kid is Haley Joel Osment, as he was in... <laughs> like 20 years ago. <laughs> in but the funny thing, Boogity 2016. <laughs> I, think, I think it's possible um, that they could redo this. And I saw a trailer online. I got kind of excited. It said coming in 2016, oh, I watched, The Return of Boogity. I watched that one, and then too. I'll, I wanted to eat my monitor the second I saw yeah. the, the the guy had edited. Do you, As I, did yeah. you realize what movie that is he edited together with the full, the no. priest? That's The Fog. Oh, okay. That's one of the end scenes from The Fog where the pirate guys come in. Spoilers, it's pirate right. ghosts. Ah, uh, sorry. You should have watched that movie. And he edited that. And then when I saw, like, the... I used a Windows font 2016. Right, I'm like, right. no! And I threw something at my desk. Mm-hmm. So as part of the sequence, though, this one of the things I'll say about Boogity, he could just he literally just keeps saying Boogity, Boogity, Boo, Boogity, Boogity, yeah. Boo. And Making then stuff shake. out of nowhere, he just starts talking. Ah, oh, what are you doing? My cloak's caught when something actually happens. <laughs> right. And my note was, oh, wow, he talks. Yeah, he broke character. <laughs> He was trying to scare them, and then it was, ah, oh, I'm caught. What's going on? <laughs> but the reason he gets caught is because he turns the uh, vacuum on Ari, who is shooting tennis balls at him, and Ari just goes up and cowers behind Boogity and sort of grabs his cloak, and it happens to get close to the vacuum cleaner, right. and he gets sucked into the vacuum cleaner, and then the clown pops back up and has his cloak in his hand, well, I think he had a, and then the cloak just disappears. Yeah, I think it had a scrap of the cloth left that they picked up, and then it poofed. And that's the happy ending. We have the uh, glowing pilgrim people, which I noticed that um, it, it's sort of a small thing, but I noticed their glow because Jonathan had kind of a blue electric glow and Marion had a pink glow. I noticed now they had a white glow. Right. And I was wondering if that was like the absence of Boogity's influence or something. Yeah, like, like that's wow, that's a really good point. They had that much forethought in this film. Hmm. Possibly, or they just <laughs> didn't put the glow on. I don't know. That's going to cost too much money. Make it pale white. <laughs> I like to give them the benefit of the doubt, though. And we have this really cheesy ending where they always come back. So they hear Boogity say something, and Carlton says, "Just kidding." Oh, it was actually it was uh, the the boy. Oh, Jonathan was it? goes, "Wanna bet?" Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because that ties to the second movie. Uh-huh. He says something at the end of the uh-huh. second movie. Okay, I gotcha. And, yeah, so that's the end of the first movie. Oh, okay. I, I have to give it to this film. I did not, when I came to the end of it, say I hated the film. I actually liked it. I did like the film. I don't okay. know that I am a... I would not say that I have the nostalgia level you had for this first one. Um, but I totally totally get why people that saw this in its original format would have liked it compared to other material out Mm -hmm. there and what they did with it and you know i mean this was this was one of the if not the first of disney's foray into making spooky short films like this right they had uh um into the woods or or on the edge of the woods was another spooky one they made uh, and they did the Watcher in the Woods. Watcher in the Woods. That's about? it. Yeah. This uh, there's a actually an article on TurnerClassicMovies dot com. If you search for Boogity and TCM, you'll probably find it. But that's where I got some pretty good information. It's a really short article, but they talked about that and some of the darker things they mention are you know Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in 1937. There was some darkness in there. There really was. And, there really was. That's what I was kind of alluding right. to earlier. Is Disney does know how to make a dark yeah. film. And some other examples. In 1949, they had The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And there was a 1952 Donald Duck short film, Trick or Treat. I don't know. Have you ever seen that one? Is that the one where he's dressed as the devil? I'm not sure. I need to look it up. I meant to look it up, but I didn't have time. Um, but anyway, yeah. Disney definitely can do dark things. But this, I think it I was mean, a mixture Levi, of... Fantasia. Right, right. Night on Ball Mountain? Ugh. And once again, that was a theatrical release. And I think... This had a lot to do with it being on television and then yeah, it was a short film. I mean, yeah, not I wanting mean, to push it too much as we we poke at it a little more. I do have to give it a little more credit. I think they were working with a much more limited budget. The overall production mm-hmm. was very much shorter than their feature stuff. Right. I mean, they shot this first movie in two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Only on a back lot. So in that sense, I think they did a pretty decent job. 
And I'm sure they didn't throw a lot of money at the writing. It might have just been Michael Janover writing it himself with no one really going over it. And, you know. Hey, and when you strip out Cheech and Chong, what are you left with? A 45-minute exactly. film. Mr. Booker. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've covered this first film pretty well. Um, mm-hmm. well let's see what we can do about uh, the sequel, Bride of Boogity. All right. Bride of Boogity. The second film. The sequel. What was the what was the time gap here between these two films? It was almost exactly a year. That's it? Yeah. You're telling me that a sequel was made within a year of the original? Fi- That's unheard of. Yeah, and this was a feature length. The first one was yeah. uh, an hour long TV, and this one was a two hour long TV, which this, came to about an hour and a half. This was a long movie. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, my my uh, nostalgia wings took me through it, so it wasn't that bad for me. <laughs> This movie um, reminded me a lot of an episode of Scooby-Doo. Yeah. There are a lot of elements of it that reminded me of that. Very much so. The first thing I noticed was this time, instead of the brassy score, we have an actual horror-ish yeah. theme with some great lightning effects and a theremin playing it in the background. It was pretty cool. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I liked that opening. That was one of the first notes I made was, I'm digging this opening. I like it a lot. See, I feel like this movie is filled with cartoon characters, and I feel like if you watch it that way, like it's a cartoon, it's more enjoyable, because Walter Witherspoon is the first character we meet, and he speaks very oddly and precisely. (laughs) I loved the cadence to his speech throughout this movie, and it added to some of the jokes that he said, I thought. There were jokes that- I had a tricorn hat on at one point. (laughs) See, when when the film came up, I actually, like, one of the first notes I made is, is who is this guy? And it, t- yeah. it took me several beats into him talking to go, that's the guy from the first, that's not John Astin. No, his name is Walter Witherspoon. John Separate Astin's character. character was Neil Witherspoon. Yeah, I didn't catch that until much later in the film. Yeah, and I don't know if he's, like, a nephew or a... He could be his son. He said he had a son the age of Jennifer, but I don't guess it really matters. Like I said, the Witherspoons seem like the keepers of Lucifer Falls history. They sort of pass things along and are very odd people, apparently. I, I think it's a, uh, a, t- a offshoot of the Adams family bloodline in this city. <laughs> it could be. Maybe there are some cousins that happen to live in Lucifer Falls. That would be some fun fan fiction. Creepy and the right? kooky, serious and spooky. They keep the town's records, the Witherspoon family? Sure. Okay, no, that didn't work. <laughs> um, so did you catch it? I, and I could be off here. When he's explaining the backstory of Mr. Boogity, did they mm-hmm. change the plot on that? Did they actually add something a little different there? Because in the first film, they talked about how he made the deal with the devil to get the cloak to get the girl. But it sounded like they changed some bits. Like, she wasn't trapped outside the house anymore. And I don't know. It it just seemed like the plot changed a little bit at this point. Well, it, it seemed like they sort of maybe streamlined it a little bit. And also, maybe Witherspoon does it. <laughs> because the way these Witherspoons operate, I don't know that they actually keep accurate records. That's very true. The way that Neil was going on to the kids, he almost seemed like he was making it up as he went along. So I think maybe they just sort of fill in the gaps as they see appropriate. Right. And also he's telling a ghost story to some kids, so I don't know if it's necessarily historically accurate. But he does mention, you know, the Davis family, and it's kind of cool to have a, a throwback to them. And a nice segue to... Yeah, a very nice shot of their house, which is very <laughs> psycho. You know, it, it looks very much like the psycho house. It's up on a hill. And I have to and... say, I like it better in this establishing shot than I did at the beginning of the other film. Because the other film was yeah. like they hadn't renovated it. They hadn't cleaned right. it up and everything. And this is very much a, as silly as it's going to sound, a cozy serial killer mansion yeah so i like it it was pretty awesome (laughs) another cool thing about this scene is i think you see in this scene a little bit of the affection between eloise and carl we kind of alluded to in the first movie that she doesn't just put up with him she goes with him and i think this demonstrates that and is something we've seen in other you know television couples that we've talked about on this show yeah and keep in mind guys we're going to keep a real big theme of that in a lot of our content when we come across it because there is so much television and and other media where they very much so portray all husbands are doddering idiots and the wife Mm -hmm. is the 
uh, uh, woebegotten. Oh, I have to put up with all of this. Um, <laughs> right. And it's it's a theme, and it's good to see good couples. I mean, for mm-hmm. that actually care about each yes, other. And yes, yeah, their acting chops may not be hundred percent on point in some cases, but it's it's still fun. And I thought there was one thing in this scene that you might have appreciated the the skull knocker that they have on the door. That was awesome. That's awesome. That was awesome. With the articulated jaw, that was really cool. So they're setting up this uh, scary prank on who turns out to be Elmer, which is Eloise's brother. And you can tell he's a salesman when he gets out of his car because he's wearing these weird checkered pants and a weird <laughs> floppy hat. What else would he do? His costume was the best. <laughs> but they had they have really good makeup and effects in their family. I don't know who, which one of them does the makeup, but pretty good makeup. Hey, you spend a year in Lucifer Falls, you learn a thing or two, right? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so did they change the set in this one? Because it looks like this is a brand new set from the first film. I mean, I think the layout's similar, yeah. but it's not the original set. At the end of the first movie, they tore everything down. It was all on the back lot. It might have been from a movie or some other project that they did, but yeah, the house was slightly different. Yeah, it didn't look bad. I thought it was... No, it looked good. And I thought it was lit better than in the first movie. I know in the first movie they were moving in and, but this one was lit a little cleaner and you could kind of see the details of the house better. I guess the first one was more of a spooky house. Like they moved into a haunted house. Right. This was more of a refined version of that, that they were actually living in. A and I thought later. they demonstrated yeah. that well. Right. And so. <laughs> this scene, I wrote that this scene is burned into my memory. This is something I always remembered because I think I pop, probably watched this movie more than the other one, but this whole scene where Elmer walks in and uh, Eloise comes down the stairs going, Elmer, and the kids start saying, spiders, spiders, and there's this giant spider that's coming down from the ceiling and they, just and they drop freak it on him. him out. That was awesome. <laughs> And he says they pull a prank every time. I'm like, dude, do you not expect this when you come to the Davis household? If I was in the Davis household, I'd probably die of a heart attack because I'd be so <laughs> on edge waiting for the next prank. Well, he could have been playing along a little bit, too. You know, well, to that's get, true. Get the yucks up with the kids, that kind of thing. That's true. And I mean, it, it seems like if you're part of the Davis family or Elmer and Eloise's family, you kind of have to appreciate that. So real quick, we have to say, Bud is back. Yeah. He's actually, he actually came back for the film. He's the only kid that came back. <laughs> um, we have a new uh, Ari who, I don't know if you recognize him. I immediately recognized him from uh, Harry and the Hendersons. Nope. Didn't catch that. Okay. Didn't catch that. Your note about that is I went, ah. <laughs> oh, and we get a scene where Carlton tells him that he's the, I don't know, what, what was it, the official mayor for the town uh, carnival? He's the oh, uh, uh, oh ceremonial mayor, basically. It. Yeah. And he says, it's the only place with the super, supernatural third eye. <laughs> And they have this dinky little sticker that they stick to their head with a third eye. Apropos of nothing, like, why is it a supernatural third eye? I want one. <laughs> I, do too, I genuinely want one. <laughs> There's a lot of things on this movie that I, I really do want, but we'll get into that as we come to them, maybe. So w- one of the lines actually using that one thing in that, ex- that same scene, I jotted mm-hmm. this down. One thing about Lucifer Falls, you're as safe yeah. out there as in your own living room. You live in a haunted house with a ghost that tried to kill you. <laughs> the hell is wrong with these parents? And my question is, would you be more or less scared if you knew for a fact that there were real ghosts that wanted to hurt you and they just <laughs> let their teenage daughter walk through the darkness home? Their teenage daughter, who I have to point out, since nice segue, Tammy Lauren. Guess what she's from? Uh, The Backstreet Boys. No. Oh. She is actually the lead. And as soon as I like, I know this woman. She was the lead actress, the final girl, as it were, from Wishmaster. Really? Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's, that's cool. That's the same one. So I'm like, so you have two actresses that went on to be main leads in two mm-hmm. other horror films off of this Disney horror film. So I'm like, that's that's actually a pretty cool coincidence. That is pretty cool. And they both played the daughter, so. Exactly. Hmm. So then we have another gag that's brought back from the first movie. Mm-hmm. Elmer starts talking and we have the wolf howl that comes back. <laughs> and he's saying that Carlton is 
has an offer to be the senior whoopee manager for the Eastern Region. And I like the whole, I like the thought that – and he says something about he's taking a crate of ha- joy buzzers to Indiana or something. And I love the thought that there's actually this network of gag salesmen and there's this whole hierarchy and there's someone in charge of the whoopee cushion sales of the Eastern Seaboard. I sell gags <laughs> and gags-related products. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. That's awesome. Senior whoopee manager, I had to pause the film and just get up and walk out of the room, scream, and then yeah. come back and hit play. Well, and then Jennifer comes in and says, Mr. Boogity's outside. I saw him. He was in a pilgrim's hat. And Carlton says, well, maybe it was the mail boy. And she goes, in a pilgrim's hat? And he says, well, this is New England. <laughs> And case in point, the Witherspoons all wear period dress all the time, apparently. And also, Ari cannot wait to test these dribble glasses, the newest in dribble glass technology. Are you excited about that, Gil? Oh, you know, I bought... <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> they, these kids, man, they, they their dad has got them hook, line, and yes. sinker. They're, th- right. the... <gasps> Levi, these uh, kids, what? these kids were the prototypes... For the Weasleys. Finding the connections everywhere. Wow. So so they also got the uh, invisibility cloak from this, I guess, then. Oh, yeah. Wow. J- yeah. JK is going to get a call from Disney. Roots. Roots grow deep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we move on to one of my favorite scenes, which is the town meeting. Oh, this killed me. Oh, oh leading up to one thing we left out. Mm-hmm. Hey, Levi, the town's about to throw this big shindig. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, Levi. What's the what's what's it called? What's the? It's called Lucy Fest because they live in Lucifer Falls. Hit pause, <laughs> move back, rolling chair, scream into pillow, come back Lucy and finish Fest. film. Lucy Fest. It's not even the Lucifer Falls Fall Festival. Lucy Fest. Which... Lucy Fest. Lucifer. Lucy Fest. Lucy Fest. Lucifer. Lucy Fest. You got to be kidding me. <laughs> oh, it's They're getting ready for Lucy. Lucy Fest, and they're having a town meeting about it. And at this point, going back to the Scooby Doo notes, we get introduced to our first red herring, which is Mrs. Hooter, <laughs> <laughs> who for some reason dresses like a witch and cackles like a witch with a, a big cloak and, and a big and hat. Puts nice little pauses in what she says when yes. she talks. She's very dramatic when she talks. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I like in this crowd, there are people that are basically cartoon characters. You've got a baker that looks like he just took a pizza out of the oven. You've got a police officer, which, okay, maybe a little bit. But then you have a mailman <laughs> with wings on his helmet. I, don't I guess. Know. Our, <laughs> I don't know. I and I was wondering, I, I made a note. I wonder if they got extras for this movie just from films that were filming oh, at that time. Oh, that would have been And hilarious. just got them in a room. Uh, uh, grab, grab Steve. Grab Steve. Grab Steve. He's in a mail. I don't I don't care if he's in a mailman outfit. Just snag him. Tell him, Steve, get, come just sit in the scene. We need them. We need you for three scenes. That's it. You can go right back to filming the Postman prequel. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Come on. And even the nor- the quote unquote normal people were dressed kind of oddly. Like there was a woman, I think she had like a scarf and a fedora on or something. I mean... It's just an oddly dressed bunch of people. Lucifer Falls is the weirdest town. I want to live there. I'm not going to lie. Lucifer Falls, right next door to Halloween Town, coming to you in whatever year that was made. (laughs) But this town, another thing about these movies is people get really excited about stuff. About nothing. About nothing. About nothing. They get really excited about putting the festival in the town square, which, duh. I mean... (laughs) Has no one ever thought about oh, this? Literally, reaction. Carlton's the this, first person. This was the exchange. They said, Town Square. Someone went, Town Square. And then another yeah. person went, Town Square. <gasps> Town Square. Town, Town Square. Square. Town Square. Town Square. <laughs> it reminds me of that scene from The Simpsons where they have the monorail guy come. Do you remember that? <laughs> monorail. 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 And they all get really excited about having a monorail. It reminded me of that. <laughs> These people are and, ridiculous. And also, Carlton says something like, we're not going to let them stop our fun, are we? They all go, no, and then they slap a third eye on their head. <laughs> Everyone in the audience has a third that eye to slap me. on their head. That killed me. <laughs> that that gag. Oh, but we are we are leaving out one very crucial character. Yes, the, who's that? The kill? the secondary bad guy of the film, Mr. Lynch. Eugene freaking Levy yes. is in this movie. 
eyebrows and all. You can't see me squeeing. I'm doing my squee face right now. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? That mustache, those eyebrows, those yeah. glasses. <laughs> I'm in. He's by far the best part of this movie. And he, he is something that I remember. This is my introduction to him as a child was this movie. And I've loved his stuff ever since. Oh, yeah. He's, you know. he's awesome. <clears throat> he's just he's just flat out awesome. <laughs> and he's this grumpy local store owner that doesn't like the Davises. He feels like they're sort of horning in on his territory and taking over and he doesn't like it. He's kind of the grumbling normal Scooby-Doo villain. Right there. It was Mr. Lynch. <laughs> You're moving in on my town. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so did, did you notice the size of the gavel that was in uh, Witherspoon's hands? Yeah. That was comically huge. It was. I, I was expecting I, him to brain somebody with that thing by yeah. the end of the film. <laughs> I feel like this whole town is perfect for Gag City because I feel like everyone in the town is on the same page about this except Mr. Lynch. Like everyone is sort of like the Davises and somehow through, you know, the universe, Davis found this. And he says at the beginning of the film to Elmer that this is his place to be. Do you ever wonder if maybe Mr. Lynch, from his perspective, that this is an episode of The Twilight Zone? (sighs) Dude. Mind blown. Yeah. I just went, I, like I just that. Chris Angeled your brain. That's, oh, don't do that. <laughs> Mind freak. Anyway, so they, they get through this scene where, where they're, they're, they're bouncing around these ideas and Crabby Davis comes up with, uh, let's, let's hold the, uh, the festivities in the town square. Mm hmm. Lucy Fest. Ugh. Um, I can't get over that. I Lucy can't Fest 2016. <laughs> We're going to make posters. Watch for Dude, them. We should make book. shirts. Lucy Fest 2016 brought to you by Midnight Layer. <laughs> Keep an eye on the shop, guys. We could have a Gag City logo in the back. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So they, they go, they come over to where they're, they're going to go over with Mr. Witherspoon to mm-hmm. the new location for Gag City. Mm-hmm. Where I, I was floored by this place. Mm-hmm. They, it's all nailed up. With graffiti. And the dad says, well, we may leave the graffiti. Adds a little touch of flair. They pull the boards off this place, go in. The door goes, thump. Right. To which he, with a big grin on his face, pops his little head in. It's like, it's great. And then you find out one of the coolest aspects of this place. Mm -hmm. It's a wax museum. It's Mr. Hamilton's House of Horrors. Yeah, I mean, this place is awesome, except for the fact that it's got no wax figures. Yeah, they actually use (laughs) static actors who stood in position for these quick framing shots that they did for each little bit where they showed Mm -hmm. somebody. And the dad jokes are so (laughs) bad. They, it, it, they keep pointing out, and she, like, offhand it goes, like, points out this person, points out that person, and then the daughter goes, oh, <laughs> look, Jack the Ripper. What? <laughs> and then uh, Ari or Corwin says, and look, Mrs. Ripper. <laughs> the the, the <laughs> apparent, you know, prostitute that he's going to murder. Oh, and, geez. you know, this is the second sequel that we've watched that references Jack the Ripper. Oh, I didn't even think Adam's about Adam's Family that. Values. Yeah. Yeah, it sure did. It sure did. He had the collector's cards. And here we get to meet one of the coolest characters, I think, also, is someone says something and Carlton doesn't know who's talking. And in the this one of the displays, this woman's just standing there with this big poofy hair. And she's like, hey, it's me. And Witherspoon leans over and says, this is Manolenska. She lives on the edge of town. <laughs> she knows <laughs> things. <laughs> so... Her hair is yeah. huge. Yeah, it's like an entire hairband from the 80s merged together to form this lady's hair. The chick that was dancing on the hood of the car in the White Snake video's hair was not as big as this lady's hair. Her hair is compelled to rotate around <laughs> Madelinska's hair because of the gravitational pull. That is ridiculous. It's huge. And it's even... <laughs> when she comes to their house later on, she has one of those pointy motorcycle hats and she puts it on top of her head and it sort of mushes her hair down (laughs) that was hilarious but anyway (laughs) madalinska decides to do a little bit of a seance and she has this crystal ball and she ends up seeing boogity and her crystal ball you mean her electric crystal ball because yeah hey it's the 80s her response corwin has to plug it in (laughs) Uh, this actually transitions from 
they have the seance. They see Boogie mm-hmm. in the crystal ball and see Jonathan. The kids exclaim, oh, Jonathan, we know him. Mm-hmm. Of course you do. Everyone knows you know him. The whole <laughs> stinking town knows your story, guys. Yeah. Sit down, kids. <laughs> right. Um, and, and they, they wrap it up with just saying, yeah, Boogity might be coming back. Dun, dun, dun. And then they go to the prep work for the actual oh, right. uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, fair itself. And the establishing right. shot that, that they come across, they do this little panning shot there to come across. Was this a scene where Jennifer had on the monochrome pantsuit or was that a different scene? Oh, my God. She had on a, like, dark turquoise one this time. And <laughs> it was just so 80s. These pantsuits are so 80s. Guys, that was a fashion thing. That was the thing. That yeah. was cool. That's why it was in yeah. there. That was cool. She's supposed to be a teenager and she's wearing this puffy monochrome pantsuit look at what you're wearing now people look at the clothes yeah. you have on look at what you dress like take a mm-hmm. picture now and then prepare to crucify yourself in 10 years yeah because you're gonna feel like she does now oh. <laughs> but we have her coming in and mrs hooter is doing her weird dance around jennifer <laughs> for whatever reason uh, i mean <laughs> this mrs. odd hooter. theatrical lady mrs hooter is so weird <laughs> And she, like like you said, she has that weird cadence to her, the way she speaks. And she always comes in swooping her cape about and with her giant, it's not even a pilgrim hat. I don't even know what it is. It's some sort of tall hat and it's got like spider webbing or something on it or lace. I had a, no- I had a note on here that a lot of the people act like this town is like a, a proto Salem. Like mm-hmm. it, it's, it's right. like, like, like it's supposed to have been. A, a city that was part of the witch trials. Like, these right. people embrace a Halloween aesthetic, you know? Right. Which is odd it, because... Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it's in the name, Lucifer Falls, right? Right. And I, I think that's probably what they're playing off with with the Pilgrim thing, but it didn't... I guess they didn't want to make that connection to witches or whatever, but for whatever reason, they went with Boogity. But uh, we go on to Mr. Witherspoon in his store. This was the point when I finally made the connection. That this was Witherspoon from the previous uh, film. It was all the way to here. Through my notes, I'm going, who is Napoleon? Who is this <laughs> character? I was angry. I'm like, I have no idea who you are. And everybody's acting like you're supposed to be here. And then it was like, oh, that's Gomez. Yeah. His I'm an idiot. Cousin <laughs> or descendant. Yeah. He's another Adam's cousin <laughs> that runs the historical society. And I think he's sort of presented as another red herring at this point because the, the scene starts with Jennifer staring at this costume of uh, like a boogity costume right. and or a pilgrim costume. But we find out that he one of his hobbies is he likes to make ice cream and he asks if the kids want to taste it's spinach with crunchy bacon bits. I mean, who doesn't want bacon bits in their ice cream with spinach? I <laughs> although what? I have to say, his flavors. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some hipsters out there making <laughs> some of these <laughs> Mr. Lynch flavors and serving them yeah. in like hubcaps or something. Now down in Midtown, spinach <laughs> ice cream, <laughs> charging like twenty dollars for oh. a thimble of it or something. <laughs> But anyway, we move on. They go to Mr. Lynch's general store, and the kids are looking at his gag toys. And, oh, my God, they just literally fall apart when they pick them up. <laughs> that was and actually a like, pretty funny sight gag. As yeah. soon as he picked up, like, oh, this is a cool little... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything fall. Even things that don't really have multiple parts fall apart. Oh, so one of the things that... Uh, uh, a quick note I made, when they come out of the... Uh, Historical Society? Historical Society. And they're walking along the sidewalk going over Mm -hmm. to Lynch's store. There's a lady standing there holding a dog leash, and it's got a dog harness, but there's no dog in that thing. Real? Oh, you know what that is? That's a a gag thing, because they sell those invisible dog leashes. But they weren't near Gag City. Well, I guess maybe it's an illusion, going back to, it's a funny thing in the town's kind of like, yuck, 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 the town's weird. Because if you saw some of their costumes during the fair, they're kind of a goofy bunch, I think. But uh, we also get another red herring with Mr. Lynch because Jennifer notices a cloak and a hat in the back corner. I think we're up to four now, maybe. But basically everyone in the town that we've met could possibly be pranking them. Mm. We go back to the Davis house and for some reason, Carlton pulls a mask out of the fridge. Yeah, that threw me pretty quick. I went pause why was there a mask in the fridge was it curing yeah i didn't know if you knew something i don't know anything about masks i know you know a little bit i didn't know if there was a reason that it was in the fridge 
I mean, if if he had just recently made it himself, that would be one thing. But mm-hmm. that didn't look. He didn't allude to the fact that that was a product. He just said, "No, check out this cool new mask I got." Right. It's like why? And he had he squirted water at one of the kids, but like, why would you need it in the fridge? Why did the mask squirt water? Well, because he's a gag uh... master. And everything squirts water. <laughs> yuck! 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 <laughs> Being a dad, I'll toss this out at you. I don't know if you do any cooking at home, but mm-hmm. Levi, don't you want your own lobster uh, apron with red trim yeah. <laughs> and lobster claw mittens right. for it? I'm like, <laughs> what is he wearing? <laughs> but again, this being the guy he is. Uh... Yeah, I could see it. I can't say much because somebody gave me one that says the dude abides. That's the <laughs> one I, I cook with. So we've all got our own quirks. But uh, we go to a scene with Corwin and Ari Mm -hmm. in their bedroom at night and Corwin wakes up and he hears some noise and he shines his flashlight directly in his little brother's face (laughs) to wake him up. (laughs) That's totally a little brother, big brother thing. (laughs) And he doesn't flinch, though. Uh, Ari doesn't flinch. You live in that house, would you? Well, that's true. Uh, But they go downstairs and, uh, okay, Gil, if you lived in a possibly haunted house... And you had had contact with a creature that tried to kill you that glowed green, and you found a glowing green key. Would you pick that up? Um, yes, and I would immediately oh, okay. try to find where it goes, and I would possibly uh, a portal to hell. Possibly a portal to hell, and I would step inside. And oh, yeah. you got to be kidding me! What is with these kids? <laughs> I mean, curiosity is one thing, but you literally had a ghost attack you in your home. And you're just climbing through these weird portals that appear out of nowhere. They end up in the graveyard and they're in front of a statue of Boogity. Did you notice before they stepped in that the boys Mm. actually have matching but alternate color robes? No, I did not know that. Their robes are tailored the exact same and they have the same pattern scheme, but their colors are alternate. And I'm like, that's a cool touch. I just looked at it as like, your mom and dad bought those for you for Christmas. Yeah. (laughs) That was a gift from mom and dad. And they thought it would be cute. And you went, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. And then you put them on and you went, okay, I actually kind of like Yeah, this. right. It's kind of comfy. <laughs> nice and soft. But I got to say, for, for those scenes, the, the setup is actually pretty good. The theremin yeah. music they play is actually pretty spooky. Mm-hmm. The glowing key effect looked really good for the time. For yeah, the effects. it really did. And that cemetery was awesome. I know. It's got the fog and it's got this great huge statue yes. of Hanover. And you had all yeah. of that real, real misty smoky wall of fog around the entire setup mm-hmm. as well it was an excellent shot i was like that of all the build-up through this film and all the they're scary and mr boogity's bad that scene went you know that actually could be scary mm-hmm. that was right. well done right and um so they actually get kind of trapped i think uh corwin says let's run away and Ari just stares at uh, this statue and he can't move, which we were alluding earlier to Boogity having powers to, to make people stand in place. Right. And like Arwen's trying or Corin's trying to pull Ari away and they both wake up. It supposedly has been a dream and they cut to a scene where the family's talking to them and trying to talk them down. And their parents are saying, no, nah, this was a dream. And Eloise has a line. You know, I once dreamed a hedgehog was chasing after me in an ambulance. <laughs> but the, the next line steals yeah. the movie for me. This is just <laughs> this. I, you made this note. I made this note. <laughs> this was actually a pretty, pretty funny. It's one funny. of my favorite lines. They have the same house, same mom and dad, same big sister. Why not the same dreams? Because it's impossible. (laughs) Is that a reason? Yes. Honey, as you get older, you'll find that if you put your mind to it, nothing is impossible. I found the key! That's impossible. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh, that was was actually funny. Because he just, without missing a beat, just his face drops and he's, yeah, that's impossible. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They cut to the next scene, which is in the morning, and Dad's got these goggles on with this little squeegee eating his grapefruit, and they decide to do a seance inside the uh, gag store for the carnival. Then we cut to a scene, which was, did you catch this? Did you see in the next scene what Mr. Lynch did? Yeah, in that next scene, I thought... (laughs) He literally pushes a baby carriage down the sidewalk, and I thought for a second, well, maybe it's somebody was carrying something. No, you hear a baby crying. Yeah! 
as it rolls away. And he, he gets this face like he just kind of gets a, he like, he looked at something like, like, like he'd opened a garbage can and got a right. real face full of it is what the yeah. face he made. And he just eh, pushes it out of the way and walks <laughs> away. Yeah. My first reaction was, he just killed that kid. Yeah. That kid is dead. And then about right. a beat and a half later, this mom comes up, looks around like, Huh? Yeah. Where's where's my kid? <laughs> oh, there's my kid, and goes and gets the cart and wanders off. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> that's almost I mean, killed a baby. Yeah. So that's definitely, uh, you know, they have a, a phrase. I forgot it's called. I think it's called "kick the dog" or something like that to show that someone's evil. You show them like kicking a dog. I mean, you show a guy just with malice pushing a baby cart carriage down a sidewalk for no reason whatsoever. You're saying this is a bad guy. Bing. This is a bad guy. Boop, boop. I guess we can move on to meet another really cool character yes. in the foggy graveyard, yes. Lazarus. This is, is this not such a cool character? He is my favorite. Now, remind me, what is that actor's name? That actor is, let me look it up. Let's vamp for a second. Bump, 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 bump. Looking up stuff. Looking mm. up stuff. I had mm. his name. Research. I should have kept Research. it out. Mm. Research. Research. Mm. Research. Research. Mm. Re re research. I actually mistook him for the uh, real deadpan comedian from the eighties. Uh, oh. um, uh, who again? Yeah. His name escapes me. This actor was Vincent Chiavelli. Vincent Chiavelli. Right. But I actually mistook it for that uh, that other. And again, that name escapes me right now. Yeah, um, it's on the tip of my tongue, but he's Billy Bob Sounds of the 70s from Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> Stephen Wright. Stephen Wright, I actually Wright, yeah. thought that was Stephen Wright. And he's so, a guy on the couch in uh, <laughs> in uh, the movie that I can't think of. Never mind, let's move on. <laughs> so, yeah, we get this, this, this pretty cool establishing shot that um, comes in. They talk to him a couple minutes about it. He explains, this is the statue for Mr. Boogity. And he, his real name is, and they do this reveal. It's like, you two knuckleheads knew that this was Boogity. He yeah. was there in the dream. Why is this kind of a na 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 moment? Right. And they should have gleaned that information from Gomez Adams telling them that the guy's name was Hanover that said Boogity all the time. So I guess maybe this is supposed to play for people who haven't been didn't paying see attention. the first movie and haven't been paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I kind of thought the same thing. It's like, that's, that's not a surprise. Yeah. But that, again, that cemetery scene is just an awesome setup. The vines mm-hmm. on the walls, the gate, everything in that is just like Disney of all the other sets on the scene. Disney knocked it out the park with that. That was yeah. awesome. Right. And Lazarus has a funny line as they leave. They say something about, have you seen anything? And he goes, no, it's pretty dead around here. <laughs> and then they cut to them going to Gag City. And it's funny because they have to pretty much push Lazarus into the store. Why did he all of a sudden become their bestest bud? Why did he? I mean, I get that the establishing shots there to introduce the character. But mm-hmm. apropos of nothing, they're just dragging along their gravedigger friend. I mean, what else does he got to do? That's no true. grapes to dig right now. That's true. No <laughs> dead peoples yet. When they go into the store, you see that Carlton and Eloise have used all of these wax mannequins, which are actually actors, by the way, just standing there. And they put all of their gags on them. And I remember as a kid seeing this, I wanted to go into this gag store and just see the little vignettes with all the weird noses and faces and everything on them. I thought that was funny. I had the opposite reaction. I went. What is wrong with these people? <laughs> you had the perfect opportunity to reopen a wax museum next to your gag shop and do a scary versus comedy kind of dichotomy thing going on. And you decided to go all Warner Brothers on Jack the Ripper? I think it's because Carlton is very one-track mind. He wants to sell gags. And He's anything be the he acquires... Manager. Exactly. He's qualified to be a senior whoopee manager of the Eastern <laughs> Seaboard. So... <laughs> Anything that comes into his sphere, he's going to use to promote gags. This is the same guy that would put a clown nose on Freddy Krueger. <laughs> and that little pig nose on the vampire. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and the giant bow tie on the mad scientist. There's some great stuff in there. It's ridiculous. But they've set up uh, basically a seance room. And Eloise is in this weird technicolor, like, gypsy outfit. And I think it's funny because they already have a caricature of 
a quote unquote gypsy in the movie and she's sort of a different caricature of a quote unquote gypsy in the movie and she has this weird affectation this voice and she's using this weird voice to talk to them and Mr. Witherspoon and Mrs. Hooter are there and then sort of under her breath in her normal voice she goes who's your friend talking about <laughs> Lazarus <laughs> and uh, they say oh he's been practicing ventriloquism and he says and I can also do a hula hoop <laughs> And this scene brings us another Wizard of Oz reference, which is the man behind the curtain. And we start the seance, and the person that's talking to them is Carlton in the next room with okay. the microphone. The, the talking to everybody, again, okay, mm-hmm. jokes. I get it. It's a gag yeah. place. But why would you set up the entire room is dark, the entire room is lit awesome, you have these great lamps, you have this great atmosphere, mm-hmm. but the way you talk to everybody is a ladybug toy phone. I loved, I think it's such a good touch because uh, it's a gag store. No! They're just, yes. He should have put like an old school, like, you know, one of those real thin cradle phones that would have been- But that's the thing, Gil. He's, he's not- you're thinking of this from someone who's into horror and scary things. I'm thinking of someone who wants to co-op that exact room for one of the midnight layer sets. Exactly. Uh. And I'm coming from this from a much different perspective. I consumed a lot more comedy stuff when I was a kid, and I love this goofy stuff. I love that they use a little uh, ladybug phone that when it goes towards someone, its little wings flap as it goes towards them. I love it. It was cute. I'll give you that. <laughs> anyway, there's a funny line where he says something. Jennifer chooses to talk to him on the phone, and she says something about Daddy, and he goes, uh, the Master of Spirits does not respond to the name Daddy, Jennifer. <laughs> and there's sort of this ongoing joke about him actually talking to the people. Um, and the phone goes up to Mr. Witherspoon, and once again, he gets really excited for no reason to pick up this joke phone. He's, like, more excited than the kids are. And we see a shadow out back right now, and we cut to the statue whose eyes start to glow in back in the uh, in the cemetery. And then a gloved hand comes up in the, the back of the store, and it has these two wires that it's going to short together, and they pull back to reveal it's Mr. Lynch, who is the scooby-doo villain at this point <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> he's wearing the hat and, and the cloak and you figure out right. it was him that did it the whole time and why do we have mm-hmm. these buried leads and all of this da, 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 da. what was the point of that i don't know it's an odd mixture of having all these red herrings for who might be acting like boogity but then boogity is a red herring for mr lynch it's a weird snake eating itself sort of circle you get into there Anyway, he brings these wires together and he electrocutes himself and Carl <laughs> on the inside. <laughs> Did you get a uh, an earnest vibe from when that happened? Yes. Because I just really want to see. You just got this wire over here, Vern. You got a little <laughs> shit word in it. <laughs> and there's a great podcast called Ernest Goes to Podcast and they talk yes. about how Ernest is basically a cartoon character yes. because he gets electrocuted. He gets smashed between things. And that's that's one reason I said I feel like this movie is just a cartoon, a live action cartoon, because both of these grown men get electrocuted with no ill effects whatsoever. Um, later on. Carlton's talking about his mic doesn't work anymore, yeah, but that's pretty he much just all. He says, oh, yeah, the guy burned out one of my best mics. He almost <laughs> killed you and himself. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, I think there's some sort of orb that busts out. Because the, in the seance, they were trying to have a seance with Boogity in this fake seance, but they made some sort of contact with him. So this green orb shoots over to the statue, and the statue breaks open and reveals kind of a cool, like, opaque ghost effect boogity. It reminded me of, I don't know if you've ever been to Disney and ridden the Haunted House ride. Yep. That's what it reminds me of. And you see the little ghost in the little chair next to you. And, I mean, it's Disney, so it's probably the exact same effect. <laughs> right. I, I don't know. I just, maybe it's having been to their... The the ghost effect is on is is excellent. I will say that that's very haunted mansion. But I guess for me, one of the problems I have is just some of the other effect filters they use, like the whole boop 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 boop. boop, boop you don't like the bubbles? That's no, the issue. bubbles. I, the <laughs> bubbles bother me. They are sort of a weird addition, and the thing is, they have some cool lightning and some light effects. But yeah, the bubbles. I don't really know why they they come up multiple times from here too, but. Uh, Let's see. They we cut back to the the, the, the Davis, Davis house at home at, at their home. breakfast nook, mm-hmm. having a family moment. 
And then, yuck, 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 you dropped a milk on yourself because the <laughs> cup was tricked. I got him. And wouldn't you notice if you lived in this house, if you have a new glass? I think she I don't indulges know about you. him. I think she genuinely just indulges her brothers at this point. You think so? Yeah. I don't know. She's a moody teenager. I don't know. <laughs> but um, they, they start talking about uh, what Lynch has done to them. And, and they finally have proof. Aha, it was definitely him because his pilgrim hat has his name in it. Yeah. Why wear your pilgrim hat that has your name stitched into it when you're well, going to try to kill someone? It's either <laughs> it's either <laughs> that or write your name in your underwear. So uh, I know, but you're that. a lot less likely to drop your underwear at the scene of a crime. It's a very different crime, but you don't run in the same circles I do. Um, <laughs> so it, one of the things I noticed about the film is, is like, did you notice how the hairstyle of the mother changes pretty radically yeah. scene to scene. Almost every scene. Yeah. In, in both movies. And she gets yeah. this she gets this kind of I don't know, nineteen fifties I'm probably using the wrong term. It's like the, a weird like bob a weird bobby kind of like a flip like the ends of her hair flip yeah, like, a, like a flipped bob. This the, next on two ball guys talk about other people's <laughs> hair. Yeah. Neither uh, one of us have hair on our heads. So. <laughs> By the way. As we scratch our beards. Um, but yeah, I did notice that, and I actually thought some of her hairstyles in the first movie especially were kind of cute. Like, she had, like, a a weird, it almost looked like horns at one point. Like, it came down from her head and out into these kind of tight curls. I don't know where she finds all the time to do her hair in these different ways, but it is funny. Like, every other scene, her hair is a little bit different. It's just odd. It's just odd. It was a <laughs> weird touch. So, then we get to this part, to the part where they, they hear some rustling around outside, and they're going to investigate. And the kid playing Bud, or the the the, the Bud from uh, Married with Children, hands his dad one of his toy guns and says, mm-hmm. "Here, Dad, take this ping pong gun. You might need it." And his dad actually looks at him like, "Good job, buddy. I got this covered." And proceeds to go outside with it in hand. Well, I think because once again he's indulging them, and they heard a sound outside, and. He doesn't think it's anything. He thinks it's Mr. Lynch coming back to spy on them. So he's just going to give him what for. And he goes outside to uh, investigate. And there was a funny moment with Corwin and Eloise. They're standing at the window watching him. And he's sort of dancing around. The little bubble effect that you hate comes up. And he sort of dances around. And Corwin goes, why is he just standing there? And Eloise goes, I don't know. I hope he didn't forget his slippers. (laughs) (laughs) She has some of those non sequitur lines that just, uh, just... You know, <laughs> now that you say it, something's occurred to me. This film would have been much better served as an 80s sitcom. Yeah. Where Mr. Boogity was just a thorn in their side consistently, and you had a nice laugh track over the end of the, fil- end of the episode that, re- that kind of, you know, dovetailed. Right. And that was actually a consideration. They actually talked about doing a TV series. A TV series at one point, I think, while the second movie was in production. That, but I guess it wasn't as popular as uh, you know. They I really wanted, think so. that that probably would have that really would have played. I think to mm-hmm. this audience at that time. So uh, we cut to a scene. Jennifer's writing in her diary, and this scene freaked me out as a kid. Her dad is floating down the hallway, laughing, giggling to himself. So like a she, madman. Yeah, and he she sticks her head out, and he just keeps saying, "Just kidding." just kidding and keeps laughing and laughing and she tries to tell her mom but she doesn't listen she still keeps her mask on her eyes so she doesn't notice how strange that he's acting but also it's carlton so how the heck would you know right exactly then we cut to a scene where the kids are talking to mr witherspoon about this and they're telling him what he did and mr witherspoon goes and what did he do (laughs) next and i (laughs) I just love this guy's line readings. He has these odd pauses and it kind of reminds it. It's almost like, you know who it is? Christopher Walken slowed down. That's or, what it is. <laughs> or similarly, is it Crispin Glover? Oh, that's a good, uh, that's a good analogy it's as well. Crispin Glover. Mm-hmm, that's about around the same time too. You're right. So Christopher this Walken, right after. Christopher Walken, I think would have played in this scene because he'd have been, <laughs> tell me what he did next <laughs> you little ragamuffin that would have been amazing and in this scene corwin had a gag city jacket which i remember as a kid i really wanted a gag city jacket it's just one of those like <laughs> khaki jackets with the thing on the back oh dude it's a totally rad 80s design too i mean it's just yeah it's these nice it's like bright pink. pink colors and yeah good you know good 
t- uh, uh, nice little, you know, putting the city on the G on the second gag. It's a very mm-hmm. 80s style, you know. Yeah. It's super cool. Pretty awesome. And they notice that uh, Marion's clothes have disappeared from the mannequin in this store. And then we go to a funny scene where Eloise and Carlton are fixing things in the store and he tries to attack her and she sort of dismisses him and he gives her the costume and she puts it on. She goes, Carlton, what do you think of? And he goes, Marion. And she goes, (laughs) Carlton. (laughs) And they sort of have this moment where she's swaying back and forth. And the oddest thing happens. What happens next, Gil? What does he do? Oh my gosh. He stands there and says, Boogity, 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 and then inflates like the guy from Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah, he inflates like a balloon. Why? I got nothing. I, I thought she was going to turn blue. And yeah. Some, some uh, Oompa Loompas <laughs> were going to roll right. around the room. It's so I, odd. And it's like Boogity can't figure out his powers he just tries to do and he's like oh i need to be big and scary so i'm gonna literally puff up well this is actually one of the notes i made at this point is what exactly is boogie trying a uh, boogie boogie trying to accomplish like i i get it like he the laid down pieces of the film are oh he wants to get the girl and he likes making people's lives a little crappy right but nothing but he-, he does is outright like overtly i guess i can't say malicious but like None of it's harmful. None of it is harmful. I think that's just incidental, though. I don't know that he wouldn't harm them if he knew how, if it would get him Marion. You know what I'm saying? But if he, I mean, if you've got the ability to animate things around the the house, you drop something. You drop a bookcase on somebody. If you have the power to transmute matter, you don't change the right. shovel from the poker set from the by the fireplace into a balloon and make them float you transmit right. their feet into something and have them sink into the ground you know what i'm saying i mean it's not right. that this ghost wasn't he he can speak he can reason he can think and i get okay it comes back to full full circle it's a kid's film okay right. sure sure we're being pedantic to a point here right but i think to answer that question maybe or at least try to address it perhaps he's willing something to happen but he doesn't articulate the mechanics behind it so he says i want you to stay there and they stay there and he wants he wants uh corwin to go away so the the shovel just turns into a balloon and takes him away what if it's a it's the devil's deal kind of thing what if the cloak has the powers but it's like a monkey's paw whatever uh, he wants to happen can't like he's trying a to channel twisted. his maliciousness into it uh, but it comes off as soft gags and that's what's kind of driven him a little more crazy over the years maybe so yeah because that would be true i'm sure there were other people in the house that he tried to do things to and yeah that would just make him more insane because as a human he didn't seem particularly insane he seemed like just a mean curmudgeonly person but as a ghost he really seems like he's off his rocker right But uh, we cut to the house, and this is the scene where Madelinska and Witherspoon drive up in her motorcycle, and (laughs) Witherspoon is riding in the sidecar with his big goggles and his leather cap on, (laughs) which was great. And you just got Carlton floating around going, boogity, just kidding, over and over. Just kidding, boogity, just kidding. (laughs) Just over and and over. And just a switch between them. And it's like they're they're fighting each other for for, uh, supremacy of his body. And then they have one other time we bring this wolf howl back right in the middle of one of Mr. Witherspoon's lines. And he says, magic cloaks are not so easy. Wolf howl to destroy. Uh So now the wolf howl gag is just cutting into sentences where it doesn't even belong. (laughs) Which I I thought was hilarious. I can't. I just. mm. Doesn't doesn't get it for you, Gil. Let's move on. Okay, (laughs) we'll just agree to disagree. I think it's hilarious. There you go. Because I feel like you have a joke and it hits two or three times. You know, you have the howl right after someone says something dramatic. And then the howl is so ever present that it just interrupts someone that's talking because it's so impatient. Anyway, I don't need to convince you. It's fine. (laughs) We don't have to like the same things. (laughs) Then we have a a night scene where... uh, Carlton starts floating again, and there's a gag with Eloise. She's tied her leg to his, so he starts dragging her down the hallway. (laughs) I actually chuckled at that one. That was actually pretty funny. (laughs) Right. And Boogity goes uh, to get the glowing key, and he opens the door, 
And meanwhile, we cut to the outside and we see Uncle Elmer and he's putting on a gorilla suit. And he's like, I'm really going to get him this time. The return of a gorilla related gag. Oh, I didn't think about that. From the first movie, they had a white right. gorilla. The second movie, they had a black gorilla. How did you like there the scene as, as he's, as the uncle's coming up to the stairs? And oh Eugene, my gosh. Eugene Le- and this is the part we, we unfortunately left out. Eugene Levy's actually, uh, in the bushes kind of looking yeah. and going, this is a weird family. Yeah. He's trying to figure him out. But and then he, he gets this double take that's just totally leaving he looks over he's like oh it's a gorilla what <laughs> <laughs> yeah he has that first little look where he's like okay i took that wait wait what that <laughs> such was a hilarious. great scene and meanwhile uh carlton as possessed by boogity he's gotten the cloak out of the magic portal but uh this is really where it turned into full tilt scooby-doo for me because they are being chased through the house by boogity boogity's running through walls Whoop, through the wall <laughs> yep. And I, I really expected the Scooby-Doo theme song to come on and their little legs to go. As they're like running in through the different things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would have been perfect. <laughs> and it's kind of funny because it's kind of a, a flip because usually you have a person in a mask scaring them. But now you've got a real ghost wearing a person as a mask trying <gasps> to scare them. From the bone vault, we get existential. <laughs> it's a deconstructed Scooby-Doo episode. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do have to say though the the makeup they did for yeah, the dad in this and the hair it was cool it was actually really played well with the the glow yeah. effect on the edge again very 80s movies yeah, very if 80s, you've seen 80s. the last dragon you guys know what i'm talking about we may cover that here you never know um but it, it just it just it, this this part in this sequence sang of an 80s film mm-hmm. but then again it also reaffirmed my what is boogity doing it, right. This cloak has to be malfunctioning because all he's doing is boogity right. and a p- picture rocks and boogity right. the bed rocks and boogity ha 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 I like scaring you this is yeah fun. and it's almost like he he gets some sort of joy out of scaring them and he forgets what his actual mission is he's right. just getting such a kick out of using these powers but yeah I don't really understand it either <clears throat> because in the first movie he definitely wanted Marion and in this movie he seems to want to dress Eloise up as Mara. Marion, but uh, I mean, he could force her to do that, or yeah, I don't, I don't really know. Oh, and we'll get to a scene like that later, right? Um, but <laughs> Uncle Elmer bursts in in his gorilla suit and starts <laughs> dancing around, and Boogity in Carl's body just sort of uh, malfunctions, and he he starts to say Boogity to Uncle Elmer, but he goes, <laughs> and he just starts laughing, and all of a sudden he starts shooting flowers and bubbles everywhere. And the whole room just fills up with brightness and uh, Carl gets exercised and the boogity spirit leaves. And I had to ask myself after this scene, I wonder if boogity was losing power when he started laughing and that was actually Carl taking over. I wonder because Carl laughs so easily. And that that's kind of what I got out of it. Okay. And then him shooting flowers and bubbles was just kind of. You know, if Boogity hadn't possessed Carl when he wore the cape and he just had the power, maybe that's what he would have done. He would have just put chattering teeth everywhere and flowers and bubbles and tried to make everybody smile and laugh. So I thought that was kind of a cool effect. I kind of felt almost like the movie was about to dovetail. Like this setup felt like it was about to just go ahead and go, hey, we got one more scene, maybe one more resolution. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Oh, no. Oh, no. You've got 30 more minutes of movie, guys. Yeah. So we go to the happy ending where they're talking about everything's fine now. And there's a funny moment where Carlton walks over. They had just, he had just taken the cape off and put it on a hanger. And he walks over to the table. The, the camera pans with him and then it pans back with him. And when he steps back over to the hanger, the hanger is rocking back and forth. And he goes, Eloise, where did you put the magic cloak? <laughs> and we find we find out that Eugene Levy has thrown a wrench into everything, and he's stolen it for himself. He's petting it like his precious, while all these green spirits are flying around. That was actually a really cool, like, coolly lit scene too. That was yeah. that was actually. I think the lighting in these movies is really great. Yes, and really, all of their effects. Except I agree with you. The bubbly thing is kind of weird, and even as a kid, I never really understood it. But um. I think all the lighting effects, the lightning effects, and the lighting itself, all great. I agree. 
I agree. And then we get to everyone's favorite, Lucy Fest. Okay. L U C L U C Y space F E S T. Yes, that's how they spelled it, Gil. How do they spell? Don't they spell the name of the city as L U C I F E R space yeah. Falls? Right? Yeah. Why I just? And... I have no idea, Gil. Moving on. Moving on. But it's it's really just a Halloween carnival, right? Yeah, that's what it I looks mean, like to me. I mean, everybody's there's in costume. There's nothing rides. Lucy. Lucy themed. Nothing Lucifer themed. Just people in costumes. Other than Bud. Well, yeah, he's the devil, that's true. <laughs> oh, what is Ari wearing? A werewolf mask. Um, and a cape? Yeah. And a gorilla suit? Yeah. Werewolves. And really long fingers? Yeah. Werewolves wear That's capes. not a costume. <laughs> that kid grabbed some crap that his <laughs> yeah. dad had in the shop right. and threw it on and said, I'm a werewolf thing. Yeah. <laughs> Ari, that's a crap costume and you should feel bad for making he's it. He's creative, Gil. You don't need to crush him like that. Step up your costume game, Ari. <laughs> but I gotta say, there's a lot of great 80s, like, Halloween costumes in here. Yes. That, I mean, they're just... The thing about 80s Halloween costumes, because now everything's all about sexy costumes, and it's I think it's really weird. We'll have a whole but different in, episode on that. Yeah. But in the 80s, everything was baggy, and everything was very much a caricature of whatever you wanted to dress as there was nothing authentic about it they actually and, had a lady in the film that that got a pretty on point uh wicked witch of the west another mm-hmm. oz reference well jennifer is dressed as glinda the good witch that is glinda yeah why with the pink is dress. oz so prevalent in this film i don't know and they also walk up to the popcorn vendor and he's dressed as a scarecrow so i don't know if that's another oz reference or if maybe they had a lot of uh Oh, duh. The director is named Oz. His first name's Oz. We've cracked, we cracked the code, the people. Code. We cracked the code. That's <laughs> right. it. From the bone vault, I'm guilt. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we're done with this. No, we're not. <laughs> We've got a few more minutes. Just like this movie, we're not quite done, so you got to stick with us. Um, <laughs> but uh, we see Mr. Witherspoon dressed as a snowman selling his ice cream. Oh, oh, Get but, your ice cream. But Levi, you... You missed uh, uh, everybody's oh favorite uh... Lazarus. <laughs> <laughs> Is it just me, or did he not look like he should be in a Pee Wee Herman movie with that getup and that puppet? He abs- and should have been so angry. Should yeah. have just been angriest of angry <laughs> that he's ever been. <laughs> he's got this ventriloquist dummy, and they're both dressed in like fifties cowboy outfits. <laughs> oh, Gene Autry would have been proud. Right. <laughs> that hat is huge. Oh my gosh, it's hilarious. But yeah, then we get to the uh, to yeah. the ice cream vendor, uh, which Mrs. again, Ho- <laughs> odd <laughs> choice of costume for be yeah. to be selling ice cream as a man made of ice. Yeah, it's so weird. It's yeah, that's very odd. <laughs> oh yeah, and then you were about to say it, Miss Witherspoon, yeah. or no, no Miss uh, Mrs. Hooter. Hooter. Miss Hooter comes up and she's dressed just like Jennifer. And I thought it was kind of a cool touch because earlier she was kind of presented as a red herring. It, it felt like they were saying she's not the bad guy now because right. we know that uh, Mr. Lynch is. And then we move to Gag City where they're doing another uh, another seance. And I noticed a little thing. This little girl was named Linda. And I know I had read that they, they threw some homages to certain horror films in this. There's a very obvious one at the end of the movie, but this little girl was named Linda. And I wondered if that was maybe sort of a reference to the exorcist, because I know in one of the first drafts of cheap thrills, uh, Michael Janover wrote basically a scene for scene remake of the beginning of the exorcist, just changing up the dialogue and making it, funny maybe that was the you know what that the prototype of that that uh scene might have led to the leslie nielsen film repossessed oh you might be right a lot of things seem to have chained off this film guys the more we dive into it some of this is silly but at the same time you look at some of it it's a pretty weird coincidence that some of these things led to the other and the timing like i said before it came out and like that article pointed out it came out before all of the sort of jokey horror movies in the late 80s and early 90s so yeah you might be right all of this may have sort of uh spun that forward a little bit but uh then we have mr lynch coming in in the cloak spitting lightning at them and uh he has this funny line about he's he's going off the rails on him and he says making people believe you're stupid so everyone would like you and eloise (laughs) says why would we have to make believe (laughs) 
<laughs> it's another one of those great, very subtle jokes that, well, I don't know if it's subtle, but it's very straightforward and... <laughs> I don't know. Those kind of jokes make me laugh. No, she she actually is a pretty big, in my eyes, redeeming factor of, of mm-hmm. this film. I mean, her her humor is on point. I love it. Her laugh, though. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, something we didn't touch on. Mm. They actually give uh, canonical for the movie itself kind of. She inherited that. That's a family thing. Her brother laughs the same way. Right. Yeah. I mentioned that when the, the first scene, when they, he comes up to the house and they try to scare him later on, they're having cake in the kitchen or something. And Carlton says something and they both laugh and they have the exact same laugh. I thought yeah. that was like, you know what? That's a good touch, guys. Right. You actually yeah. kept it in the family. That's funny. And I think it's funny, too, that they're named Elmer and Eloise because they're both they both sound like older names. Like right. older people names and they're just kind of funny sounding names. Uh, I'm not disparaging anyone named Elmer or Eloise, but just together they sound kind of funny and like from an old 50s sitcom or something. Small touch, but did you notice in the scene where they're they're about to get into where um, the family's talking after the seance, they're talking mm-hmm. back and forth with Lynch. Do you know what the dad is dressed up as? Not particularly. I know he's a clown, but I don't know what particular. It's the clown that pops out of the vacuum at the end of the first film. Oh my gosh, you're right. That's why he has that weird... Googly eyes. Googly and the eyes weird, with the tongue. weird smile with the oh tongue. Oh my gosh, you're right. I have never caught that. Good call. Good call. This movie, man, there's layers. There's there are layers. layers. And another layer I thought I might try to point out is... Mr. Lynch goes off on them and he talks about you come in here with your chain stores and you take over. And I, I was thinking, if you look at it from Lynch's perspective, once again, in this scenario, he's the little guy, the local store owner that's being pushed out by a big company franchise that's coming in. He's the local coffee shop that closes down because some guy opens a Starbucks next door. I never thought about. Yeah. Layers. Like an <laughs> Layers, onion. People. Yeah, and that kind of clicked with me when he said something about, you know, you being a franchise. And this movie sort of presents the Davises as the good people. And obviously, the local business owner is evil because he pushed a baby carriage down the street. But um, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. And it's a very 80s thing to say, go big corporate America. And uh, anyway... So what about in this scene where, where when Lynch is talking, he uses the cape and just kind of moves the mm-hmm. the head of that, that – was that a cannibal the, survivor or a guy that yeah, was Yeah, he was like a, a safari guy that was being cooked a lot. That was an old, uh, an old gag in a lot of uh, like Abbott and Costello type movies where they would be being cooked alive by the natives. Usually but by yeah. people in blackface. <laughs> yeah. I don't like to talk about those sorts of things too much because it makes me kind of sad for yesteryear. And yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we won't go too much into the heavy stuff. Thanks, the real 50s. Heavy stuff. <laughs> Thanks, 50s. <laughs> right. One thing I noticed here, too, is that Eugene Levy's face looks like the Groucho Mark glasses <laughs> that the statues are wearing. He's yeah. got the eyebrows. He's got the glasses. He's got the mustache. <laughs> I will say this, though. I mean, for, for this being a kids film and mm-hmm. i mean it's it's mainstream it's not i mean mm-hmm. this it, it can't say it's not this showed on i guess what abc fam or abc whatever the network is that yeah. we're showing these on and of the actors in this movie eugene levy is just killing it he yeah. is just all in for this character of lynch yeah his expressions and everything yeah i mean he really sells it as this you know this crotchety old man he's just in it and uh, i hate you davis but then through great. But then throughout his sort of tirade, it comes out that basically he just wants some friends. Yeah. And at the end of it, Eloise says, "Well, we'll be your friends." And I, I think it says something about the Davises too that everything that he's done to them, he almost killed their dad with electricity. But they forgive him and they accept him and they want to be friends with him. And I think that says something about their sort of genuine nature and their genuine joy for life that they would just forgive this guy and say look we can be friends we don't have to fight each other and i think that's a sentiment that could definitely stand to extend in the world these days not to get too deep but no no i'd agree (laughs) i would agree well then right after that we actually get boogity doing something (laughs) for half a second Mm -hmm. half a second boogity is on point on what he's doing he turns around and boogity after he possesses eugene levy's character 
He boom, freezes the Davises in place to get mm-hmm. what he wants across. Then he turns and animates the first set of wax figures, and I go, "Yes, he's actually yeah. gonna he's gonna turn these guys in the town. It's gonna be great. You know, it's gonna be a turning point of the film where Boogity's actually gonna get scary." And then I remember what the Davises did to them. Yeah, and all <laughs> my hopes are dashed <laughs> like a candle hitting the ground. <laughs> They, they just s- sort of wander around, and they're so incompetent. There's a wolf man. There is uh, Dracula. Uh, Do- Dracula. There's Doctor Jekyll in Mid Transformation of Mister Hyde. There's all these things, and then you have a cannibal survivor guy with a scuba mask on. Yeah, I, j- I. <laughs> well, he's about to go in the boiling water, so he needs something to protect his eyes. Stop adding logic and reason to this. <laughs> Let me be angry. Hey, I'm just trying to think like Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a funny moment where uh, he, Mr. Lynch makes the switch and Eloise says, he's been boogity eyes. <laughs> and I loved that uh, Mr. Boogity says, Marion. And they have this cool music that comes in, like these violins, and they bring it in later. It's this very dramatic, almost operatic score, I guess. Right. And sort of represents his affection for her, his misguided affection. But uh, like you said, the wax people are brought to life and they quote unquote terrorize the town. Uh, They just sort of wander outside and walk through things. They don't really do much. (laughs) Yeah, they they tear apart a couple of things and they they just kind of. They're just kind of like I said, Boogie, Boogie just is like the most inconvenient ghost. Is, yeah, is is what I'd call him. Like he right. just he does things that are like, oh well, that's irritating. It's not like, oh, I popped a tire, then I wrecked my car. It's like, oh, the AC's not working and blowing right. as cold as I wanted to. <laughs> right, darn you, Boogie. <laughs> exactly. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on. He's just almost competent. And the 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 townspeople's reactions to these things, yeah. is, the Davis's reactions to these things mm-hmm. is like, oh, they're just kind of causing some messes. Let's get them contained. They're, just push them over. Yeah. They're walking around like stiffs because they've got no joints. They're wax fingers. Right. Just push them over. I think at some point they just stop. Stop. For no reason. They just stop. And that's that's where I get into the, what are the extent of the powers of this thing? Because- it almost feels like when Boogity got enough distance away mm-hmm. from them, right. the magic actually stopped. Right. I don't know. It's weird. Or he focused his attention elsewhere. Oh, true. Um, this is a distraction to get them. That's right. This is just a distraction to get them out right. of his way so we could go You're right. The that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he goes back and he turns the key, and that's when he releases his, I guess, true form from the statue. And there was kind of a cool effect here with the statue cracking open and the light pouring out. Yeah, I felt a very, very Ghostbusters vibe mm-hmm. when that right. started coming apart, like a, uh, you know, Dana and them coming out of the uh, uh, Hellhounds at the end mm-hmm. of the movie. Right. Uh, so that was, that was a pretty cool effect. Mm-hmm. Did you, did you feel like I did that they were setting up um, uh, uh, the character, uh, the kid that's dressed as Satan to potentially do a, well, I'm the devil, you made a deal with me uh, kind oh, of I thing for the that. end of the film? I was, I was kind of looking forward to seeing, because of how the devil was depicted in the flashback. Exactly. That's oh, what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay, maybe. And then they didn't touch it. They just No, they didn't do it at all. It so, was just a funny sight gag, I guess, for them. But yeah, they could have played off that a little bit. That would have been cool. Well, you get this, yeah, like Levi said, you get this really cool breakout scene where Boogity is actually freed from the <laughs> statue and all the parts fall. And I got to say, again, that was actually a pretty cool effect uh, mm-hmm. of him leading into that. He, f- you know, with a flourish, he flings the cloak over his back, he enveloped mm-hmm. in the green light. Again, right. a good effect. The makeup was on point for this. Mm-hmm. But then it falls short again. Yeah. Because <laughs> Boogity's at his full power now and he's going to go back and he's going to cause problems. And the parents haven't realized that the kids are gone. Yeah. And they're just putting stuff back like it's cool. Yeah. And all of a sudden, Mr. Lynch is a good guy now. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Man, this is where things just fall apart. This is where things have to be tied up in 10 minutes. (laughs) And he literally turns her into the Bride of Frankenstein, right? I mean, there's no way around that. Yeah, there's no no ifs, ands, no buts. How did they get away with Universal not suing them because there is no questions about it he zaps her she Mm -hmm. floats into the air oh wait wait before we get to that part though there was a great scene where he animates the bike of uh the the gypsy and she she does the old shaky fist i'm going to get you for this (laughs) right and then runs 
And did he, uh, he brought to life Lazarus's puppet as well. Yep. And, and th- there's a funny thing where, uh, the puppet turns to say something to him and he slowly brings both hands into the frame. That was kind of funny. Yeah, but the thing he says is he just goes boogity boogity boo. I mean, yeah, I mean, the... uh, we get it, guys. So yeah, he he turns Eloise basically into his bride, and he brings her up to him. He levitates her, and he holds Carlton in place with his green buzzing force field. <laughs> and they bring in those strings again. The very, I'd call it like mournful and sort of romantic. He's bringing her back. I thought that music was pretty good. I don't know if they had the orchestra like they did the first time, but um. Whoever did the music did a great job. And then they decide that they're going to have a seance to contact Jonathan to see what to do. And why is Jonathan dressed like a space pilgrim? I, 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 I had that. I just don't. I even... mean, he's, he's wearing a pilgrim outfit. Okay. In the first movie, he had a regular pilgrim's outfit with a glow effect around him. This movie, he's wearing a silver LeMay shiny pilgrim suit. I mean... Why does he need to wear that? Because that's what ghosts swear. <laughs> Ghost dressed like spacemen from the 50s. <laughs> but he basically tells them... Next on From the Bone Vault, spacemen from the 50s. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, he basically tells them what to do, take the key to the graveyard, and uh, they get the key, which is glowing bright red now, and Carlton plugs it into the headstone at the grave, it breaks open, and all these spirits come out. It reminded me of when they opened the Ark in Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> right. All the spirits come out and eat the guys. But Jonathan had warned them that if Boogity is touching anyone, when he gets sucked back into hell, they could get sucked back in with him. And he's got a hold of, uh, I think he has Eloise at the moment, right? And yeah. he's pulling her in. And then Jennifer comes up dressed as Marion. And she pretends to be Marion and tricks Boogity the brain trust that he is <laughs> and <laughs> and so he, he moves really toward is just a complete idiot right yeah, like yeah, i'm not off is. base here but he the weird thing is and you alluded to this earlier what's he doing because he tried to make her marion earlier so why does he think that jennifer is marion i mean we haven't had any scenes where boogity's seen the other spirits or said them my name other than other than marion he didn't True. say anything about the child Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's almost like he's oblivious to their existence, but they in turn go, oh no, Boogity's coming and he keeps me here, but he never even interacts with them. Hold on here. Let's think about what happened at the in the first movie. What if when they defeated him, they destroyed part of him and distilled him to a more like feral nature and that got trapped in the statue? And that was released. And, and that was released. Made, made whole, quote unquote. But then, right. again, I mean, if uh, with the cloak, if you go that route, I mean, it's just, it's still, I guess, yeah, maybe the, the mind behind it is not whole, but now the power right. is complete. Right. I think the, if you want to look at it this way, I think the cloak brings the power and the spirit has the mind. Does that right. make sense? So maybe if that's the case, maybe the, but I mean, this is a Sunday, uh, Disney scary movie, so they probably <laughs> didn't put that much thought into it, but that's what we're here for, folks. <laughs> Adding layers. But we'll close this out. <laughs> Basically, Jennifer is as incompetent as a lot of, uh, females trying to get away from bad guys at the end of movies. She Oops, trips. I tripped and fell. <laughs> for no reason whatsoever. And, uh, Carlton pulls her back. Everybody works together, even Mr. Lynch, to pull her back from the, clutches of hell and uh, after they do this the statue sort of rebuilds itself and witherspoon goes very interesting <laughs> thank you witherspoon we i kind of wish they would have just gone to credits right there i think that would have been a great way to end the movie with witherspoon just saying very interesting um <laughs> but you alluded to it earlier you want to tell us how they go out here oh man they they alluding they to the polish, first movie they polish it off with a nice well that's the last we'll see of him I don't think so. <laughs> Heartbeat, they turn around. Just kidding. Just kidding. Jonathan being the little joker again. Oh, <laughs> Jonathan, really? The weird thing is, the second the credits come up, they go to this happy score that's more like the beginning of the first movie. It's this brassy, bright sound. But even in doing that, they they set it against these great, yeah. great font. Lightning, yeah. Great green, bold, bright text with mm-hmm. this dark, foreboding house with this burp boop boop right. over it. And it's like, I guess they're trying to send send off the kids to bed with good good happy thoughts. But one thing I wanted to tie into, uh, we talked about this a little bit in This Island Earth, and I just kind of noticed it. Did you notice the general color effects that they used for the ghosts? 
What colors? Yeah, I, I really liked it. Jonathan had his predominantly blue. Mm-hmm. Marianne had her predominantly pink. Mm-hmm. And Boogity had his predominantly green. Right. Uh, so we and, have that red, green, blue, uh, uh, I guess you say trichotomy, not dichotomy, that we can sort of tie back to some of the other effects. That seems to be... That's a good point. Following through. That's a very through. good point. That's, <laughs> uh, we're going to have to see if we can find this in, in, uh, in these films. We'll have films. to keep an eye out, for sure. And with that, I think we can put the final nail in this coffin. And next week, we're going to run through the streets covered in green jello singing I'm an Oscar Mayer wiener when Gil and I tackle one of our personal favorite dystopian futures in the action film Demolition Man. Be well. Let's wrap it up with this. If you need to reach us online, you can uh, reach out to www.midnightlayershow.com. If Facebook is your poison, you can go to facebook.com forward slash midnightlayershow. Uh, on Twitter, we're at twitter.com forward slash midnight layer TV. And as always, uh, our YouTube channel via the main site. And if you want to get in touch with us, please email us at from the bone vault at gmail.com. Oh, from the bone vaults, this is Gil. And this is Levi. Good night and stay scary. Boogity! Kidding! <laughs> Thank you for listening to episode four of From the Bone Vault, Mr. Boogity and Bride of Boogity. This has been a Midnight Layer Studios production. (laughs) 